Hey, you're going to hear Daryl talking about his signature Godin guitar, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the guitar. First of all, it allows you to go from passive to active pickups, so it's essentially like having two sets of pickups on one guitar. And if the battery dies, just switch over to passive pickups so you'll never have a loss of sound. You can also split the humbuckers to get single coil pickups. It's got a true lock tremolo system, which is a proprietary system Godin developed for optimal tuning stability. And the other really cool thing about that is you can set the tension of the the tremolo bar you get to customize it so it sits the way you want it to be compound radius neck it's got a rich light fretboard the neck is very stable as a result of the rich light and in fact last night i actually had dinner with daryl and he told me plain and simple the guitar just never goes out of tune no matter where he's traveling or what the weather conditions are like and i got to see the guitar up close the quilting on the body is freaking gorgeous man and you don't typically get a signature guitar with all these things including two seymour duncan pickups at a street price Price of only $16.50. So my first thought was, oh, it's got to be made in China. Nope. It's made right there in Canada by second and third generation people that have been working for Godin. I'd encourage you to check out the Daryl Sturmer signature guitar. Go to godinguitars.com forward slash DS. That's G-O-D-I-N guitars.com forward slash DS. This is an important announcement for anyone who wants to advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar. Over the last nine months alone, we've had 425,000 more downloads, added over 25,000 monthly listens, and grown our YouTube subscriber base by 72 times. During this time, we've kept our advertising rates consistent, but we will be increasing rates on January 1st. So if you're a business looking to generate new leads or increase your cash flow by picking up new clients or customers, or if you're a label looking to promote new music, then listen up. For information on advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, fill in the short form at everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Even if you want to advertise next year, you'll get to lock into marketing your product or service at the current rates before rates go up at the end of this year. You know, much of your success as an online business, especially with guitars, will depend on your domain name. The owner of two great guitar domain names has contacted me and he has them for sale. Those two domain names are guitarbuyers.com and cashforguitars.com. Call or email them at the contact information listed on that page and they will give you 20% off the purchase price. In addition, they'll work with you to make payments if that's what you need. Again, that's guitarbuyers.com and cashforguitars.com. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the seven most important things to consider when hiring a realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to westfloridarealestate.com. That's westfloridarealestate.com. Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, I've got a really special guest today. Not only have I wanted Daryl Sturmer to come on the show badly, but he's been a big request from loads of listeners, and we got him today thanks to Mario Biferali over at Godan. So thank you, Mario, for connecting us. Um, quick announcement. Um, if you are not, if you don't know this, you can now watch the shows on YouTube. So check them out there in addition to listening to the podcast, wherever you listen to them and subscribe to the YouTube channel while you're on there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a brief background on Daryl in case you don't know him. He's been touring the world with Genesis and Phil Collins since 1978. That is a huge number, man. I mean, I, I think that's the longest tenured person I've interviewed. I mean, that's 41 years, right? Absolutely, yes. 
I've been married 41 years as well. To Phil and Genesis. <laughs> a couple. Man, that is truly amazing. His first big break was auditioning for and getting the gig with fusion electric violinist Jean-Luc Ponty. Then in late 1977, he was recommended as a replacement for longtime member Steve Hackett for the British progressive rock supergroup Genesis beginning his 30-year, or 40-year now, permanent part-time stint as lead guitarist with Genesis, touring the world to sold-out crowds and performing on, performing on seven Genesis albums. When Phil Collins, obviously the drummer for Genesis, launched a solo career in the early 80s, Daryl became an integral member of Collins' solo band, creating the signature guitar sounds of his solo mega-hits, In the Air Tonight and Easy Lover, and he was co-writer of Collins' 1989 Grammy Award-winning and Billboard number no. 4 single, Something Happened on the Way to Heaven. He's played on 10 Phil Collins records, 7 Genesis records, 4 Jean-Luc Ponty albums, and he's recorded on albums by Frida Lingstad from, Ab from ABBA, Philip Bailey from Earth, Wind & Fire, Joan Armitrading, who we had here on the show a while back. Man, she was awesome. Wow. She was, she was you know, I, I don't know what kind of people interview her usually but they were very defensive in the beginning I don't but we had a laugh man she was like really cool person man. oh that's great yeah that's and she's and she's had tons of great guitar players over the years yes mm -hmm. I, in fact on the album I played with her also Adrian Ballou was on that album. oh yeah Adrian, I just interviewed yesterday do you happen to know Chris Spedding I, I don't know but I know who that is, yeah. Yeah, English guy. He played with her. Uh, Les Davis. A lot of people have played with her. Uh, he's also been on albums with George Duke, obviously from Frank Zappa and solo career, Peter Frampton and others. He's performed at the Super Bowl, Academy Awards, the Oscars, the MTV Awards, the VH1 Rock Awards, and the You'll Be In My Heart Tarzan Worldwide Premiere Tour. He also runs his own independent record label called Urban Island Music. Daryl's released nine solo albums and opened for Mike and the Mechanics in early 2015. Mike Rutherford, of course, being Daryl's tour mate with Genesis. And, oh, I also want to thank Anto Drennan because Anto has uh, also pushed me on to you. So thank you, Anto. Uh, we are here. Daryl, thank you so much for your time, and I'm really happy to have you on the show. I'm happy to be here. I've, I, this is really going to be fun, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's always fun, man. I don't do anything. I'm too old. You know, 55, I stop doing anything unless it's fun, to be totally honest. Uh, I, I've got you by 11 years. I'm not 11 years older than you. Are you really? You look great, man. Oh, well, yeah. You know, see the whole body here. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. No, you look great, man. You really do. You. Um, your first big break was getting the gig, I'm assuming, with Ponty. Yes, it is. Okay. The story behind how you got that, I read about that. It was really cool, and I was hoping you can talk about that. Sure. Um, well, I, I was in a band with my brother. Uh, my brother's name is Dwayne, and we had a band called Sweet Bob. And we had pl played jazz, fusion, pop, R&B, the whole thing. But um, <clears throat> we played in this one nightclub in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, this is where I'm from. And I was born and raised here. and we were in this for about two years at this point playing. We started at three days a week, then four, then five. So we were playing five days a week. But what happened was um, we had a, a weekend off and we went down to see Frank Zappa's band in Chicago at the Chicago Auditorium Theater. I'll never forget it. And uh, before we went to the show, <laughs> this is kind of a long story. It's great. We, Go ahead. Take your time. Okay, before we went to the show, our drummer wanted to stop in at Frank's Drum Shop. <laughs> okay, and that was it's a famous drum shop, at the, especially at that time. And uh, we went in there, and uh, he wanted to buy a few things. He ended up just buying some sticks. He went over to the counter, the drummer in my band, and there was a guy standing there, and, and he, he asked the guy standing there, he says, are you going to go to the Frank Zapp show tonight? And, he's, and the guy looked at him, he says, uh, well, I'm his drummer. And it was Chester Thompson. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. And, and he oh my God. So uh, all of a sudden, we all came over and we introduced ourselves. And Chester, you know, didn't know us from Adam, but he invited us to the show. He says, I'll, I'll guys give you backstage passes. Wow. Which is, I wouldn't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, maybe if they're musicians, but you know, things were different. Things were a lot looser back then, you know. Yeah. So, and this would have been probably 1970, 
four or five, I think. And uh, so we ended up going to the show. I was always a big fan of Frank Zappa. And it was a great show, great band. And we got backstage, got to meet a lot of different people in the band, uh, George Duke and Ruth Underwood and Ian Underwood, all these people who were, you know, big names in that band for us. And so what happened is the next time that Zappa came through Milwaukee, he, uh, he, we were talking to him and telling us, you know, you guys should come down to our club where we were playing when you're on a day off or on a, after your show. I can't remember really what, what it was. Well, about a handful of their musicians came down. It was George Duke and Chester Thompson. Ralph Humphreys was also on drums. They had drummers at the time. Tom Fowler and played bass and I think that was about it. So they all sat in with us we, at different times. So when I was noticing people were kind of going back and forth and some people were playing, some were not, they were exchanging. How about if you play guitar? So I was gonna leave and next to me was George Duke playing keyboards and I was ready to put, I was putting my guitar down. He says, hey, where, hey kid, where are you going? And I said, well, I thought maybe someone else would wanna play. He said, no, you stay up here. I said, okay. And I was a big fan of George Duke because I had been listening to him on an album that my brother brought back from Vietnam. My brother was in the military at the time. This, uh, your brother, Dwayne. Yeah. He was in Vietnam. Yeah, he was in Vietnam. Holy and, crap. And so he had picked up an import album. And it was, it was, it was called Jean-Luc Ponty Live at the Experience, which was a nightclub in L.A. Live at the Experience featuring the George Duke Trio. Oh, okay. I, I mean, to, <laughs> when I think back to all this, you know, that was Jean-Luc Pondy, that's George Duke. And, uh, and I was a big fan of this album. It was a live album. And here's George Duke sitting, you know, next to me playing fantastic. Sitting next to you telling you don't leave. Don't leave. And yeah. I'm 21 years old, you know. It's incredible. And, 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 you know, and I look at these guys like they're such veterans because they're a 31, 32-year-old guy. <laughs> <laughs> funny how that works, isn't it? Huh? Yeah, isn't that funny? And and I was thinking, these guys really are experienced. They know everything. And, and so, George Duke, so George Duke actually uh, had me stay up there and played. So okay, so that happened. Then 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 what happened later? Maybe months later, um, my band and I were going to go out to Los Angeles and take our cassette tape and try to get a record deal. Because in those days, you might you actually could maybe go to a record company and submit your tape. Yeah. But when I think about that tape now. There was no hits on there. There was nothing that was commercial. <laughs> we wouldn't have gotten a deal, and we didn't. So anyway, while we were out there, our singer, her name was Sylvia St. James, and uh, she was out there. Uh, that's a very cool name for a, yeah. for a female singer, man. I got to tell you, that's perfect. She was a great, beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, black uh, woman, girl singer, still apparently doing it out there. But uh, she was out there doing some visiting, and uh, she, she had sang on a George Duke record or something she was singing a background vocal she told george duke that the band's coming into town and he said he says is the guitar player coming out said, yes so anyway what happened is i was at my hotel and i got a phone call from sylvia saying george duke is going to call you <laughs> which made me so nervous and george duke called me and he says i was thinking about uh recommending you to jean-luc pondy he's looking for a guitarist for his he just got signed to Atlantic Records, did his first album, and he wants to go on tour. And I thought, oh, my God. I'm a big fan of both of these people. And, and uh, next thing you know, Jean-Luc Ponty is on the phone talking to me. And I, I could hardly talk because this is a guy I idolized for many years. And he's played with Frank Zappa. He played with Mahavishnu Orchestra. And here he is talking to me on the phone. So three days later, I'm, I'm driving over to... Jean-Luc Ponty's house, which was on Little Laurel Canyon Drive in Los Angeles. There's Laurel Canyon and there's this little uh, drive for about uh, four blocks or something like that. And I remember um, two guys in the band, my band, were with me and they were dropping me off. And uh, I, I remember getting out of the car and I was walking towards his house and Jean-Luc opens the door and he's standing there and my legs are just about ready to be about. Because wow. I'm so nervous. I got so, oh my God. There's that guy that I've seen on stage, listened to for years. And he's not a very tall guy. He's about five, six or something like that. Very short guy. But I'm 
to me, a big figure. You know? <laughs> did you have a guitar with you? I, yes, I did. Okay. And uh, so he introduced himself and I walked in and there's a piano player there. And it's a female piano player and she's about my age. I think she was a year younger than me. It was Patrice Russian. And Patrice was a very, she was just starting to get known at this point. I mean, today now she's played with like people like Lee Rittenauer and a lot of the monster players. She wrote, uh, I think, the main theme for one of the movies like Men in Black or something. You know, I'm not positive about that, but she did some big hit songs. But anyway, she's just this 20-year-old girl and I'm a 21-year-old kid. And I, th I never heard, I mean, I heard of her. And... Um, so after we got talking, Jean-Luc Ponty put some music in front of me. <laughs> and I am not a great sight reader of music. I can read music, but I'm not a great sight reader. Did you study? Uh, did yeah. you go to school for music? No, I did not. No, okay. but I only took lessons for one year. So yeah. you're like most of the self-taught guys. You Pretty know, you've you just pounded away and pounded. And you did your 10,000 hours multiple times and, yeah. and then picked up stuff and asking others and then putting it into place. Right. But I, I also played trumpet in um, grade school and high school. Okay. So I could read trumpet music, guitar, not so much. But I, right. I could. Uh, so first song he gives me, it was on his first album on Atlantic. It was called Poly Folk Dance, meaning polyrhythmic. <laughs> oh my I god the time signature and it was in nine eight <laughs> <laughs> it's not stressful enough that he you get yeah. sight read in front of jean-luc ponty but in right. nine eight but here's here's the thing what i'm good at is i can read music like i said i can't sight read music quickly but i can memorize very quickly Hmm. I just looked at it and I was going, dun, 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 and I'm learning this. Then I'm going to the next section and checking that out. It's not that it's an incredibly difficult song, but it, you know, reading in nine eight is 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 different. <laughs> uh, of course. And so I got I I really I think I've never read better in my life. When we started playing, I saw I did okay, and and it had a solo section, not in nine eight. It was in four four, and it, things went well. I think we did about three songs. And this is just the three of us, piano, acoustic piano, acoustic violin, and guitar. And I think it went well. And, and he thought so too. And he says, well, I don't know what I'm going to, I don't have any uh, tour set up at this moment, but I'm thinking that uh, you were someone I'd like to consider guitar. So I, I walked out of there saying, I can't believe I maybe have this gig. Right. That's how it kind of came about. You know, um, a lot of anxiety, yeah, a lot of pressure, but it, uh, you know, it worked out. Plus, plus, me being a fan of his, I think, was a good thing, and that I knew the kind of thing he likes, and I admired what he 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 does anyway. So sure, that was the story, basically, how that all happened. And then, when did you get the call? Uh, it was probably a month later, as far as, and and then they said, well, we're going to. Uh, get together in August. I think this was like June or something like that. And then uh, I went my, to my first, uh, had to fly out to Los Angeles and um, we were rehearsing at a place called um, SIR, Studio, yeah, sure. Studio Instrument Rentals. And uh, it was right next to another, uh, it was pretty much close to Paramount Studios. And anyway, I remember going in and it was Tom Fowler on bass. Now here's a guy that was in Zappo when I, when we, he's on bass. Uh, we had a, a keyboard player and a drummer that I didn't know. And uh, I, the reason why um, I'm not mentioning their names is they ended up not doing the tour. Okay. Uh, they, they ended up getting some other guys. But um, Tom Fowler, I was also a fan of. And, you know, so here, Jean-Luc Ponty, Tom Fowler, all these veteran guys that are 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> what did your parents say when you went out there? Uh, well, they were always pretty supportive of me. Um, as far as a, as a musician, I think they they thought I was going to play guitar on the side and have a different job <laughs> during the day. Right. But my dad especially was one of these that would always come to the gigs, you know, whenever, that's cool. hey, that's my son up there, blah, 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 all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, that's really cool. Very supportive. Because as a dad yourself, you know, like 20 years old, 20, that's a baby going out to L.A. 
you know, halfway with people, with older guys, you don't yeah. know. So that's in the back of their heads. You know, I'm assuming it was, it would have been mine anyway. But um, yeah, that's a big thing. Well, you know, when I was on the Genesis 2007 tour, that was kind of a, like a reunion tour that we did. I remember all of our kids were there. Uh, back, <laughs> we were there like at Wembley Stadium or something like that in London. And all of our kids were there and they were all, most of them were uh, upper 20s, early 30s, and some even 40. Yeah. And I just think we were in our you know, 21, 22 years old on the road. That looks too young to be touring. These kids already look too young to me. And they were in their 30s. But I think they, they are. As you know, man, kids today are not, and not to sound like old men, but in my opinion, a 21-year-old today is like a 15-year-old maybe. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, you know, and, I, and I'm not, and I've been, uh, I'm, even my own kids, I'm including that, and I have not been the guy that like gave them everything. I made them earn their way and they all had jobs. I don't know why. It, I don't, you know, internet, whatever the hell, but it's different. It I is. think so. Yeah, you're right. It is very different. And, uh, you know, and I would be afraid to see one of my daughters, you know, going on tour or something at that age. Yeah. Hell yeah. Very much. What a great story, man. That is so cool. What, what, what a really cool story. And um, <laughs> that's amazing. I, I'm just, when all, in hindsight, when you look back and think of this, mm. why do you think that happened? Like, uh, so let me clarify the question. Do you think it's like, uh, like, I don't know if you're spiritual or like, this is part of a bigger plan and, or you random luck. I, I mean, if you've even thought of that. Well, I have, because when I'm telling that story and I'm saying, you know, I was listening to an album, Jean-Luc Ponty plays at the experience with George Duke. And I ended up, that's how I got the gig with Jean-Luc Ponty. There's something else out there. Right. You know, I may not be a religious person, but I'm a very spiritual person. Yeah. I, and I get into things like that. And I get it, I'm, a, I'm into transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. I do things like that before even our shows with Genesis or Phil Collins. And um, it's, it's, I know there's got to be a reason why that happened. Right. Because, and, you know, I don't even know how me playing guitar really came about. I mean, I know, I know how that happened, but why did that happen? And, and I, you know, I never had another job other than teaching guitar and playing guitar. That's all I've ever had. I've never had anything else. Good for you. And, you know, and my, I don't, I didn't live up. I didn't uh, get raised in a, a rich family. My father is a factory worker. My mm -hmm. mother worked at a nursing home. That's it. It was on the South side of Milwaukee. Uh, which is just a blue collar, collar. So I don't know how I got to this, if you want to call it success level, on many levels successful. De definitely. Yeah. And so, you know, but I have to say that I don't know if I made these things happen, but I really prepared and I really practiced a lot. Um, uh, some of the kids would come over and say, hey, Daryl, when do you want to come out? I said, well, I'm going to just play the guitar for a while. Right. You know? an hour and and my my friends used to say to me and i had a lot of friends and uh my buddies would say to me you know someday we're going to see you on ed sullivan <laughs> Close. Yeah. well I, I ended up uh, being on you know uh, the tonight show was phil collins and and sean luke Pontia was on the merv griffin show and the dinah show uh, that was dinah short yeah, yeah i remember that uh, super bowl man you played the freaking super bowl that had to be what was that like well, that, that was great. I think, when was that? Like 2000, I think? 1999 or 2000. Uh, it was, uh, I, what surprised me about the Super Bowl is how much preparation they have to do. Because mm. you go down, it was, in, it was in Atlanta. And we went down there as a band. And three, four days early. Because they have rehearsals for like two, three days prior to do the Super Bowl. Make sure everything goes on time. So like would, sound checks, sound type of things. Yeah, that's got to be massive. They, they have to pull out all these, uh, all these stages, and they're timing them. They're saying, "Oh, we're off by a, a minute and a half." That's a lot. Wow, four so days they, early to be that. Right. So that's days and days and days. And and how we did that show, uh, a lot of people said, "Did you play live?" I said, "It's a combination of live and track because what we did is we recorded the band live, the rhythm track." 
Mm. But Phil sang live on the show itself. Okay. So you're hearing our band, a live recording, in other words, of mm. us, but Phil is singing live at that moment. So he was the only thing live that people were seeing. Right. He was and singing live, and we were, we were miming to a live recording. Wow. And they, that was for sound purposes, I'm assuming? Yeah. Because or were they afraid everybody's going to get undressed and pull out their nipples or something? Like that? <laughs> well, <laughs> Genesis is known for that. <laughs> yeah, but this was the Phil Collins band. And, yeah. and, um, but uh, the why that is, is because there's so many groups that one plays after another. See, so okay. do a sound check. And then, do, so it's better to get at least an aspect of this really tight. And yeah. I, I agree that someone should actually be singing live. Yeah. But I mean, the band, that's the, that's the hard thing to mix is drums and bass and keyboards. So, if, and especially if you have a band with horns and we have horns. So it's better to get a great mix of that and just record it and then put that out. But it's not like a, a record recording. Yeah. It's live uh, mixing console recording, you know, that's live a, from the board. I'm assuming that's still done like that. You know, I don't know. Uh, but that was in, two, I think, 1999, I think it was. Yeah. That makes sense because this way everybody's levels the same and you don't, cause they don't have the time. Like you just said to make adjustment. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. But the difference in, in today is a lot of people are singing to auto tune. <laughs> uh, great. So, yeah. you know, I mean, Phil was singing live. I, I mean, Tina Turner, I believe was on the show. I, you know, these are people who were actually singing, singing yeah. live without any help. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, Go back to your the, the thing about spirituality. I, I agree with you. I think certain things happen, especially, and I, I was glad you mentioned that, that. That you getting the gig with Ponty didn't start when George Duke came to town. It started when your brother was in Vietnam and bought that record. Right. That, that, that I don't believe, I feel the same way as you. There's too many if it's one coincidence, yeah, but that's a series of, of events, and I think there's something greater out there. I'm the same as you. I'm not a religious person, but I, I am, you know, even more so being more and more spiritual about stuff like that um, yeah. because it's just too random for certain things to happen. Yeah, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, things go well and some things don't go well, and, but somehow they all work out. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't be, you know, it's like, I remember I was listening to the, you know, the guy, uh, he is Bill Maher. Yeah, he, sure. Wanted, Religulous. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I, I was, uh, what was something was really interesting that he said, he said about religion. He said, he said, my problem is, he says that people tell me that, yes, there is a God. And some people say, no, there isn't. He says, I don't know. Right. That's the way I feel about things. I mean, I feel there is a uh, higher power. Uh, yeah. And, and um, whether that's God, how uh, my religion that I grew up with was, I was a Lutheran. Right. I, my parents were very uh, religious. I don't know if that's how it is, but I'm not, I'm not saying that I know it's not or that I know it is. Right, right. I'm, I'm just saying I don't know, but I do feel something's out there. You know, or right. Like, yeah, there's some either a higher power or some sense of connectivity that's going on that's, I don't want to use the word managing, but right. out there. You know, I agree with you 100%. And I feel the same way too because I hear a lot of uh, this, you know, we're, I think where this gets sticky from my perspective anyway is when people introduce dogma as to, you know, it's all in this book. No, it's all in that book. And I'm like, man, it's not po it's it's not possible for everybody to be right you know it's it's, it's just what's right for you and i'm totally good with that you know yeah me too thank you man i appreciate that um that was interesting uh who recommends you to replace steve hackett and what was that audition process like if there was one um there's a bass player that i i knew very well his name was alfonso johnson and he played Why do i know that name uh, what was he in a weather report. Okay. Then called weather report, which I was a big fan of, uh, big jazz fusion. Yeah. Kind of thing. And, um, and he got the call to audition because they needed a guitarist that could play bass. He's a great bass player, but he's not, not really a guitar player. So, so he went to the audition. The reason why he went to the audition, I believe Chester Thompson recommended him because he was in weather report with again, Chester. 
Yeah, Chester Thompson was in Weather Report. He recommended um, Alfonso Johnson to Genesis because he was in Genesis at this point. This was <laughs> 1977. And Chester was in Genesis, which I have a story about that. Uh, just a real brief yeah. side. I was, uh, I remember I was on tour with Jean-Luc Ponty in 1977. And we're in O'Hare uh, Field, uh, you know, in Chicago. That's the airport. And I look over and go, there's Chester Thompson. So I go, hey, Chester, how you doing? And because I knew him because of the, uh, you know, the Zappa thing. And in fact, he even sat in with Sweet Bottom another time he came into town. My band. So yeah. I was Jean-Luc Ponty, and I see, I see him, and we start talking. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm with uh, the musical The Wiz. Oh, wow. I remember and that. Really, I said, really? And he says, yeah, but I'm going to be uh, playing with Genesis. I went, what? <laughs> and my only uh, thing that I, the thing that I used to hear, see of, uh, in Genesis in my head at this point, because I didn't know much about Genesis, was I saw him on a, I saw Peter Gabriel on a show on television and they played a clip and he was wearing this flower on his head. <laughs> Part of a, a thing called Supper's Ready, it's called Willow Farm. <laughs> and so that was my perception of Genesis, a right. costume. And I thought, I can't see Chester in a costume. <laughs> right, right. No, no, he says, no, man, they're really a great band. And but so all of a sudden, um, Jean-Luc Ponty, gave me a cassette one time and he said he said you should listen to this band and it was uh on one side was a trick of the tail uh -huh. and the other side was wind and weathering but the whole album didn't fit on these cassettes because their right. records are pretty long and i became an instant fan of of them but anyway so that that's that was the first time i heard that chester was going with uh Genesis, but that's a little a little side story. But um, Alfonso Johnson was recommended by Chester Thompson to, and, and, and Alfonso went and auditioned, and fabulous bass player, great bass player. But they needed a guy who could play guitar more, and bass would be like the secondary instrument. You know, like occasionally you'll play bass. Steve Hackett was a, is an excellent guitar player. Why did they need a, a guitar player to play? But did they, they didn't have enough. Well, okay. Well, at, in 1978, they did an album called And Then There Were Three. Yeah, I remember that. Genesis. Mike played bass and guitar on that album. Oh, okay. Mike was starting to get interested in being maybe more of a, a, a lead guitarist at that point, because Steve, Steve left. I mean, that's a hard shoe, his shoe to fill. But he's, he, he was playing a lot of guitar on the album, and he wanted to do that live as well. Not on all the songs, but maybe like he was going to pick like five or six songs that you play guitar. In. So he needed whoever was playing guitar to play bass. Got it. So since Alfonso wasn't the right pick for that, he said, well, I know this guy, Daryl Sturmer. He, you know, he played with Jean-Luc Ponty, blah, blah, blah. So I guess Mike told me that, Mike Rutherford told me that he had listened to me on a Jean-Luc Ponty album and liked what he heard. So uh, what happened from there, so Alfonso recommends me I get a call uh, from their tour manager and they fly me to New York. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I picked up some Genesis albums and started learning these albums. I just oh thought, my God, that is not, yeah, <laughs> that's not like learning Freddie King blues. You know, <laughs> and I love Freddie, but I'm just saying. <laughs> but uh, no, I know it's very complicated stuff. In fact, they were really very complicated stuff. And, uh, but I started learning it and, and going as hard as I could at it. And I remember this was December of 77 uh, because their album came out. It wasn't even out yet. They sent me a cassette of five songs hmm. and they even had working titles on them because the album was just coming out uh, called, and then there were three. And one song was called Calypso, which ended up to be the song, follow you, follow me. Oh, wow. It was just had a kind of a Calypso feel to it. Another song was called 5 8 because it was in 5 8. <laughs> but it was, it's called Down and Out. Right. And then they had a song called Squonk. And then they had a song called uh, uh, Los Endos. These were all songs that were on like Trick of the Tail album. And um, so I learned these five songs. And then I also bought some more records by them just to get more of an idea mm -hmm. of what they're all about, even though I had a cassette with two of their albums already. And um, I, so I flew to New York. And I remember walking in 
and there was Mike Rutherford. And Mike Rutherford is a very tall guy. He's about six four. I'm five eight. You know, right. so I, I'm looking up to this guy, and he's he's very British, and he's uh, he, <laughs> he's, he's very, very British. British. <laughs> well, he's he's very mumbled. Yeah. You know, whereas I can understand Phil Collins right away. I I used to have a hard time understanding Mike. So yeah. I'm every other word, and I'm going yes, yeah, right. But we got along very, very well. Right. We sat down, and all there was, there's a pedal board, and then there's a monitor, and then he's got a cassette player next to him. And these, he says, well, let's, let's, let's do Calypso or whatever it was. That he plays that song, and I start playing along with it. It's just, so I thought, by the way, I thought the whole band was going to be there. It was just Mike. Just Mike. Maybe, maybe the manager told me it was going to be just Mike, but I don't remember. I was in such a fog thinking I might be auditioning for this band. And uh, so Hold Mike... A and meanwhile, you're still with... I mean, you're still with Ponty or... No, no, at this point, I had been with him for three years and there was like this long hiatus. Okay. We didn't know what was coming next. We had to okay. Like, so uh, anyway, so I, I'm, we're playing this song and, and he says, well, Steve uses this... Uh, it wasn't uh it was an older song he says steve uses this this uh, this uh pedal or this distortion pedal or this delay unit and, and i ne i didn't have any pedals or anything because i was in the pondy jazz fusion i think the most sophisticated thing i had was a wawa okay you know, that was it which makes sense yeah anyway so and there's all these pedals in front of me and mike's pressing the pedals saying here's what he uses on this one so i'm playing the song we do about half the song. He stops the cassette. He says, let's go on to the next one. We did this four times. There was five songs on the cassette. We did four times. And I'm thinking, I probably don't have this gig because he's not letting me play the whole song. And he stops and he goes, well, um, and he, this is exactly what he said to me. He said, well, I think you're the one. <laughs> that was as shocking to you as anybody, right? <laughs> but, uh, you <laughs> So he says, oh, what I'll do is, he says, I have four other guys to audition today. And he said, I will uh, ring you at the Plaza. They put me up at the Plaza Hotel. He says, wow, that's gorgeous, man. Yeah. And Mike was there too. And he says, I'll ring you at five o'clock and uh, I'll run through the songs that you should learn for the tour. And I said, oh, when's the tour? <laughs> it's in about a month. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, for rehearsals. And I'm thinking, I got to learn. Okay. So. Uh, I come back and I call my wife and I said, you know, I think I have the gig with Genesis. And I said, but I, you know, I'm not sure about this. You know, she says, what do you mean you're not sure? Take the gig. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking like, what, how, what is this going to be like? Am I going to be able to really play? Cause they, they're a very structured band. And I was used to a much looser situation. I was the second fiddle to John Luc Ponty sort of, you know, mm. when, it was another solo it would have been me so you know i had a lot of uh soloing to do and a lot of ad lib but in genesis it's very specific and so part of my my kind of artistic side said maybe that's not the right thing for me right it was ridiculous of course but now my wife said just take the gig okay wait a minute so, you were married in 77 uh let me think no not yet i that, how long have you been with your wife since 1978. Oh, oh, you mean I'd be with, we were married in 78, December of 78. Uh, so we were together about three years prior to that. So 75. So you've been with your wife 44 years. Yeah. Dude, God bless you. That's awesome, man. Holy yeah. crap. It worked out, but it did. And it's yeah. Hard. Yeah, it's great. Congratulations. That is, that's your biggest accomplishment. I got to tell you, man. <laughs> I think so. No, it's like, you know, you, you don't hear that very often. That's yeah. great. Although, you know, Mike Rutherford, Tony Banks, same thing. They were married before I was. So, wow. That's they, really nice to hear. That's great. Yeah. It's, it's that kind of band in a way, you know, and uh, Chester Thompson as well. Um, everybody was, like Mike was married probably a year or two prior to me, same with Tony Banks. So That's really cool. All basically been over 40 years. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, Mike, Mike then said, I'll, I'll ring you at five o'clock and... Uh, we're running through songs. You come to my room. So I went to it. I went to the, by the way, it was six o'clock that he rang me. So I, <laughs> English time. <laughs> I thought it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I went to his room and he had a list of all these songs. He was playing me cassettes. He was playing me all this stuff. I'm going, oh my God, 
I got 25 songs to learn, you know, not knowing that some of these songs are going to be put together. Okay. Some, you know, but I'm thinking I had to learn the whole song. And, but I did say to him this, I said, okay, I recognize two other guitar player names on this list of guys. Cause he told me who was coming. And um, I recognize two, two names are very good players. I said, what was it about me? And he said, well, you're the only one that came prepared. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, one of the guys said, so uh, what key is this song in? Another guy said, what style of music is this? Oh, my God. I said, Did you send the cassette to everybody? He said, yeah. And I said, you're kidding. And he said, he said, in England, they tried out more than 20 guitar players. That was a different situation. They wanted to find an, a British guitarist because, you know, they're, they are all right there. They all live yeah. in but they didn't find what they wanted. So they thought, we'll go to America. We'll probably find someone there because it's a much more competitive kind of a thing. Well, it's a lot bigger too. Yeah, it's a lot bigger. There's a lot more choice. So I, I got this. There was five guys auditioning that day, and I was one of them. And, and I got it. And it was mainly about, yes, I can play, but it's also about preparation. It's about preparing for this, getting ready to do it and learning what you were given. And I went a little further and wanted to get more history on the band. Because I, I was listening to him on those two cassettes that Ponte gave me, but I really wanted to get inside of them and figure out what, what they're all about. I think that's how I got the gig. Um, yes, two of the other guys that I knew of could probably get the, handle, handle it as well, but they didn't prepare for it and they didn't want it enough. You know, isn't that... You obviously have a really good work ethic. Yeah. And I, I pride myself on my work ethic. I really, I not because I like, it's me. That's who I am, you know, not because I, you either have that or you don't. That's embarrassing, man, to be honest with you, isn't it? How do you show up at a gig with one of the biggest bands out there? And like, so what style? I mean, that's, yeah, uh, that is horrible, man. I, I said this in an interview one time. Well, uh, there was a, there's a, um, a video of, a uh, documentary on Genesis. And one of the things that they took from my interview, because they don't take everything you say. Sure. Like this, you know. Yeah. But they, they, they took the part where I said, um, what do you mean what style is this? This is Genesis. That's the style. There's no other band like it. Yeah. So there's no other band like Yes. There's no, you know. Yeah. A lot of bands, they have their signature. And that's what Genesis has. And I thought, that's a ridiculous question. Uh, it's, it's absurd. It's embarrassing, to be honest with you, is what it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's good for you, man. You did the work and you earned it. That's good for you. You got the right guy for the right job. That's fantastic, man. It worked out. I'm still, I'm still with Phil. And if Genesis ever wants to do anything else, I'm, I'm sure I'll do it with him. That's fantastic. Great stories, man. Thank you so much. Really good. I really enjoyed hearing that. I can't believe you've been with your wife that long. That's really good. <laughs> that's that's the, the most unbelievable part. Yeah, it, well, that's 40-something years is a long time. Well, you notice, too, like I said, you don't look uh, 66. So to me, you're like a few years older than me. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm thinking of the math here. I was, what are you, 13? And like, you know, I'm trying to... <laughs> uh, well, you know, the thing, what I... I attribute to this because I, when I see like Mike Rutherford, for instance, hmm. he looks great. He's always looks great to me. Um, I think music keeps you younger. I think yeah. it keeps you in that, that ballpark that you want. I still feel like a kid in a way, you know, I don't feel my age at all. I feel about 15 years younger than my age. Good. You know, I, I feel like I'm 55 or something like that, or 50 years old as opposed to 66. You know? Yeah. And so, and, but I think the music has kept me young. Being around people that feel young, that keeps you young. Because I know a lot of people, if I go to a high school reunion, for instance, say you're 40th or something. Bad to do, man. <laughs> this guy gave up. <laughs> and gave up. You know, like you're, you're the kind of person that I know that, you know, you work out, you yeah. get the fist, You know, and that's the, way, that's the way it is in bands. I feel like I'm almost working out because, you know, you have to look a little bit better because you're going to be on stage. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, you're conscious of it, you know, and um, the music itself keeps you young and it keeps you attached to younger people. Yeah. You, know, you can be like, this is the first time my own, I have a band as well. It's the first time I'm the oldest guy in the band. I've always been the youngest. Guy in the band. But 
that what when that happens, I notice like for me, I, I, that doesn't change. Once you guys, same thing used to happen to me. And now I notice everywhere I'm the oldest guy. It's not just like in a situation, you know? True. You know, and, uh, but you know, even like the Phil Collins band, it's all ages. We have a drummer. It's, it's Nicholas Collins. It's Phil's son. It's Phil's son. Oh, wow. 18. 18? 18. And, um, Holy smokes. and uh, some other guys in the band are, you know, 40 and some, you know, but, I'm not even in the oldest guy in that band, you know. I yeah. think Leland Scalar, our bass player. Bass player, yeah. 72 years old. And I don't oh. think of him as 72, even though he's always looked 72. Because <laughs> he's always... Yeah, because like, the long white beard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Wow. Yeah, but I think also, too, when you... It's, it's not just the music, but when you're playing music, it's something that makes you happy. Yeah. You know, and I think happiness is really such an important key to everything in your life. You know, I think you're, I think you're just so much of a better person about everything when you're happy with, with what you're doing and stuff. Yeah. I think it keeps you physically young. It keeps you mentally young. I, I mentioned Chris Spedding. He's 75. I was talking to him yesterday and he was like, Hey man, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I got back to you later. I don't even know what it was, but he goes, I've been on tour with Brian Ferry. He's 75, man. He was all over the world, you know? So, I mean, I was like, great, more power to you, dude. You know, awesome. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> is there any, you've been doing this a long time. Is, is there anything that still surprises you, Daryl, about uh, playing such large venues or in such big productions? Yeah, this is a funny, funny answer, but what surprises me is, is that they're still coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. You know, I've heard, I hear that all the time. Well, like, you know, we just got off a tour uh, in Europe uh, recently. I mean, just like three months ago, I think it was. And um, it was Phil, Phil's band. And we did South America. We did um, uh, Australia prior to that. And these were all stadium shows. Wow. Stadiums where we're having 25 to 35. And in, in um, where it was, Sa Sao Paulo, we had 54,000 people. That's great, man. And you go out there and what surprises me is that energy that hits me every time I think, oh, I'm so used to this. I do this all the time. You walk in there, boom, it hits you. You know, and that's, it's almost like the spiritual thing. You think physically nothing is really happening, but it sure feels like it is. Yeah. You know, it's like hitting you. And you look out there and these people have been standing out there for a couple hours prior to us being there because they want to be in the front row of that first 20 because, by the way, you know, over there, they don't have seats, generally. Most of the oh. time, standing on the main pitch of the soccer stadium. Yeah. Seats around the sides, but there's on the main, main floor, they're standing. Some of the shows had, had seats, but a lot of them didn't. So they come early, and they just stand there, and they wait for you. The fans are great. What's really funny is you see some of the same people at a lot of the shows. They're following the band. They're traveling, going to the next place. That's and fantastic. There was a band we had one time, and she, uh, she, she was actually in the military, and she had, and she had all this off time. So she went on tour, and she wanted to buy me and Mike Rutherford and Tony Banks a drink at the Four Seasons Hotel in Boston. <laughs> and she, she was there, and. I want to buy you a drink because it's my birthday, she says. And I said, well, we should be buying you a drink. She said, no, I want to buy you guys a drink. She said that she's been following us everywhere. It cost her $35,000. She was going on a trip, flying different places, taking trains, going to, she bought all these tickets for all these shows to see us. Wow. I mean, <laughs> that's a little wacky maybe, but uh, this, this is the kind of, <laughs> some of the fans we have. Well, did you got to name a wing of your house after her? <laughs> <laughs> and we look down there and there's a lot of times there's about six to 10 people that we see a lot. Like at every at, show. Yeah. That's and great, man. That's a, lot really, loyalty, a lot of loyalty. That's and really a, nice. And a lot of them are the, now their kids. <laughs> some of the people that have been following us since the eighties. Hmm. have older. That's and wonderful, man. Kids. That's really cool. I have, I've had a lot of guys, like I had Phil Collin from Def Leppard on and I, he, he said, you know, that we're having this like Indian sum, Indian summer in our careers it just blows me away. And he said the same thing because we see the same people that were with their kids, you know, when they were, 
when Def Leppard was the big guys back in the day and they're at the shows with their kids now. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I mentioned Joan before. How did you wind up working with Joan Armitrading? Let me think. Um, I, I just got a call from uh, manage, uh, Phil Collins uh, Genesis Management and a, a, a guy named Steve Lillywhite. He's, an, he's a producer. producer. Yeah, very well-known producer. Time producer, yeah. And, and said that Steve Lillywhite's going to be calling you. So he called me and he's been producing this Joan Armour trading record. And uh, they flew me over and where we were recording this was in Polar Studios in Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, that's cool. Polar Studios is owned by ABBA. So it was, it's a really cool studio. And so I came there and w- what was a nice surprise to me, the bass player was Tony Levin. Oh, wow. And the drummer was Jerry Murata, which was also Peter Gabriel's drummer. So those two guys were, I, I was a real fan of them too. So we, that, I was there for probably, probably a week. And then the next guy coming in was Adrian Ballou. That's so funny. Is that how you got hooked up with uh, Frida? How this happened was a little more obvious reason. Uh, Phil Collins was producing it. Oh, okay. okay. The Frida album. And so they got me and a, a keyboard player named Peter Robinson, which he worked with in uh, Brand X. Phil okay, was in yeah. X. And then the Earth, Wind & Fire horns. That's how the Earth, Wind & Fire became... Phil's horn section and it's, it's just, a, but it's just amazing. Um, that was a great album to do too. I really enjoyed working on that album. Is it a Joan album or the, or the, or the Frida? Well, but I yeah. mean, uh, Frida, especially because I knew these people. Oh, so those guys. And uh, it was same studio, Paul R studios, Abba studios. Yeah, that was a wonderful time. There was a really good song off that record that did pretty well called, I know there's something going on. That was the one song that became the VH1 video, one of the top videos, because what was happening, the song came out, didn't do very well. Then they did a video on VH1, and all of a sudden the song just went up in the charts. It fills the drums on it. I mean, it's great drumming, of course. Very cool, man. Yeah. Uh, Your record label, Urban Island Music, is that just for you to release your music, or do you have other outside artists on there? you know, when we originally did it, it was, it was for me. And then we thought maybe we'll get some other, we, we just decided not to. It, it's difficult enough. Oh, us. it's, it's, yeah. You know, I, 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 it's I, crazy. I, I can't do it. I can't, I'm not that kind of business guy. But it's, it's a full-time job. You can't just do something like that part-time. That's the thing. You know, you can't casually, you, you know, even if you pick somebody up, then you got to market them. You got to put it out. It's, you know, it's like, it's like being a part-time accountant. You, you yes. really, can't do that man you gotta like give it to the accountant to do or you d- do it yourself full time you know that's exactly right so we yeah. decided not to <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's not get more people I'm, yeah. I'm hard enough i totally get that <laughs> top three uh, knee-jerk reaction what's your top three musical experiences because you've had so many great ones well i yeah i know exactly what they are um meeting george duke and playing but the first record i ever played on was a George Duke record. Wow. I was, I was rehearsing with John Luke Ponty for the first tour. George Duke walks over because Paramount Studios is pretty much right near um, SIR Studios. And he says, when you're done there, Jean-Luc, because they know each other. And he says, can I borrow your guitar player? <laughs> and I'm going, yes, he can. <laughs> he can have me. So I went over there and um, I'll, I'll never forget it because that was a great experience. It being my first album ever, even my band Sweet Bond, we, we did little local projects, but nothing national. And it was a guy named Ndugu on drums. His name is Leon Chancellor. Ndugu, which I knew who he was. A bass player named uh, Byron Miller. And um, there were some other players on it. But it was called a song called That's What She Said. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on an album called I Love the Blues. She heard my cry. That's a cool title. And it's you can it just go on you. I just saw it the other day. I, I went on YouTube and I put in and I saw that's what she said. And it's a picture of the album cover. There's no video, but you can hear the song. And I'm playing a lot of Wawa on it. That's but your your one effect. Yeah, my one. Effect. <laughs> and there's a lot of guitar on it. That's great, man. And so he's the guy. I will put it 
I hate using this word that discovered me. Yeah, but he changed your life. He changed my life. And, and I got on my first record I ever did was with him. That's amazing. And this, uh, I'd say the other, the other thing was to uh, Jean-Luc Ponty with being an, the other, the, and this is not a special, not a particular order. These yeah. are special things. Uh, playing with Jean-Luc Ponty is, is one of the biggest things because that's, st- that really started the ball rolling, you know, auditioning for him doing that and then doing George Stu's record during this rehearsal period. And then the next one of, of course is uh, Genesis getting that, that has really changed a lot of things because that is a group that is bigger than life. You know, I mean, that yeah. is, no, really, there's not a lot of groups that right. bring it, that kind of power to the table, man. Right. And it, and it's, it's not just pop music, it's credible music. And it's, it's respected by a lot of musicians, a lot of drummers that are even, fabulous drummers just think Phil is like one of the greatest drummers there are because he's got so much personality. Uh, Mike, Tony and Phil have such chemistry. You know, they are just unbelievable together. So it just all works. And it was successful for me in many ways, financially as well. And musically, it's great because it changed the way I listen to music, the way I play music now. Mm. When you heard my mentioning to me my solo record i heard all the genesis in there man i gotta be honest with you the production and, even and there's, there's jean-luc ponty in there yeah. it's jean-luc it's genesis it's boom you know that's how i probably would have never made that record it's, it's an album called go and i would have never made that record uh without being in genesis it was great. Actually, let me just talk briefly about it. it because not only was the production, but the even the uh, the mastering and the engineering. You, I heard as I was listening, it's like, wow, this I hear the influences of of Genesis on your playing. Um, so let me just tell people that um, Daryl's got a bunch of records out. I read this before. I'm sorry. I mean, look, it's nine solo albums. I, the last one it was called Go. Uh, if you are a guitar player, I would really encourage you to listen to it. He is really a badass shredder, but it's a, he's playing prog and I don't, I don't know, he's fusion. Even it's just, it's really great rock is, is what it is. But um, you had a song in there that I really dug called Urbanista. Oh yeah. What was a, is there a backstory to that? Um, it's funny. I, I put, I have another version of that song on an earlier album where wow. I play nylon string guitar. It was more of okay. an acoustic thing. And then I thought, I always wanted to do, and that, that one was called Urban Island. Oh, okay. But I wanted to do that, do a different version of the same song. So I, and it had this kind of, I don't know, a, a little, a different feel to it, a more like a South American, you know, kind of vibe to it. So I called it Urbanista. Doesn't really mean anything. It's just a made up word. But that was, it was a song I did on an earlier album. Um, what album was that called? Uh, you know, when you do like eight to 10 albums, you, you, tr- you start forgetting which song is. That's, that's a massive catalog. Cause I mean, it's close coming up close to a hundred songs. That's pretty, yeah, yeah that's yeah. a lot of stuff to keep track of. I, I understand so, that. Totally. Well, thank you for that. I, I, you know, I really, ent- we, I do that song live with my band every time. Also, I, you know, I do some, sh- uh, I have done about six or seven shows with symphonies now. And I, and I orchestrated that song as well. Really? That's not easy to do. That's a big undertaking. <laughs> it's yeah. not. I, uh, out of the uh, 12 songs that we do, I orchestrated five of the songs. Oh, wow. That's heavy. And I like to orchestrate my own originals because when I do these sh- symphony shows, I do Genesis music. Uh, I do a Phil Collins song that I co-wrote with him and something happened on the way to heaven. And then I do three of my instrumentals and Irma Issa is one of them. Uh, one on, on the same album uh, called uh, Heavy Heart. Right. And another one on that same album called um, Masala Mantra. The other two songs I dug a lot on that record were Masala Mantra and Meltdown. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, boy, that's a hard song to play. <laughs> Everything here, I was like blown away. This is some re- great stuff on here, man. I'm not just blowing smoke. It, this is really great stuff. You know, anybody who's a guitar player, check it out. When you mentioned Meltdown, uh, I wrote that song in 1980. Oh, and wow. we used to play it with my band's uh, sweep on when I would come off the road with Genesis. And uh, we used to play that song. I, re- I remember writing it right after, right after a Jean-Luc Ponty tour, in fact. That's a long time ago. I probably wrote it a- after 1975. 
after or 70 uh sorry around 78 as far as when i wrote it but i didn't play it until 1980 do you happen to know mike keneally uh i don't think so played with zappa uh play, uh a west coast guy played with he plays with joe satriani played with vi he um you're not really musically similar but he he plays jazz fusion stuff but he also does orchestra uh, hmm. arrangement stuff so you're he's really the, what you do remind me you're really bright like when i spoke to you the first we just spoke for a few minutes but i i remember putting the phone in man this guy sounds like he's really bright so i always got to make sure i sleep well bring my a game when i have <laughs> bright guys on this show uh but he's the same way so if you ever meet him run into it i think you guys would probably hit it off and he's bright musically as you are as well yeah. i remember one of the first things you said to me though was when i said hello i'm this is daryl Sturmer, and you said wow you really have that midwest accent <laughs> that's the new york in me man i always hear that you know what um uh you know i studied uh i've always i've studied a lot of like um psychology but how people relate because i've been in sales for 30 years and i always wanted to learn that and so i'm an i'm a really hardcore auditory which means i interpret mostly by ears you know some people like are visuals and some people they call kinesthetics by feel and I don't have a sense of smell either. So I think that uh, amplifies my hearing for some reason. Like, so I pick up, like, uh, like I'll be out to dinner with someone and uh, the waiter comes by and we'll be with another couple and, oh, I wonder where he's from. Like, oh, he's Lebanese. I'm like, how do you know he's Lebanese? Come on, man. You think he, I'm like, no, I just, he, where are yeah. you from? Lebanon, you know? So I, I think, so I hear these, it's, 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 I like it. I like hearing accents, man. And that was quick because I had only said, I'm calling for, for Craig Garber. <laughs> I'm calling, this is Daryl Sturman. And you got it right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, your accent is, I, I, I'm sitting here enjoying every minute listening to you because I keep hearing that, man. I love accents, any kind of accents. I really dig them, man. I'm lucky my wife's in the UK, so I get to. Well, you know, oh, that's interesting too because most people think I'm going to be from England. Because I'm with Genesis. So oh. Not, wow. They don't hear me talk. Okay, like, right, right. When they hear me actually talk, they think, oh, I thought you were going to be British. Oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes sense now. That's cool. Um, you answer some of these things. Sorry, I'm skipping over here. What, any, any low points or dark periods you've had to deal with, Daryl? And, and, and how'd you get through them? Actually, uh, one was... Uh, fairly recent um in 2000 uh, <clears throat> let me see that's about a year and a half ago my wife got uh, breast cancer oh man how and is she doing good now and it, it almost makes me break up just saying it now but it was like a um uh she had to get mastectomy and she was stage three cancer but um what happened is um the hardest part about this too was at one point, I had to go on the road while she was getting chemotherapy. So I would take her to take, take her yeah. to go like once a week, drive her there every. And then this one month, I couldn't do it. But what was great, her mother—I mean, her brother came into town and stayed with her the whole time I was in South America. Because it's like uh, South America. We were, I was going to be gone for five weeks, and and I thought I'm I may not do this tour because I have to be here. But he said, no, you go on. And she told me, she said, no, you go on the tour. I'll be fine with my brother, Gavin. And he was, and he was great. He stayed. But I was able to, to get to the last chemotherapy uh, week, the week I got back. I, I was glad to do the last one. I had done all of them prior to this. This, this lasted, chemotherapy is like three months of this. And then there's radiation after that. And that's every day, five days a week. And so we were able to do that. But so that was a real low point. Um, How's she doing? She's doing really good now. Uh, that she's, it's been about, uh, it's, it's been over a year now, but her hair is uh, almost all the way back to normal. But it, she was wearing wigs, you know, just to feel like I can go out now. So that was a low point. And that was, that was actually 2017 and 18. <sighs> yeah. Uh, if I was there, I'd give you a hug right now because I went through this in 1996 with Ann. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, same thing. So I know I have been in your shoes. 
I know exactly mm -hmm. the sense of utter powerlessness yep. that this brings you. And uh, man, I'm sorry. I'm really glad she's okay. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, it's really, 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 really good. The only problem now is she just has some neuropathy in her feet and because, you know, like everything is real sensitive, but no, she's, she's got a great attitude, but it was a pretty dark time. And um, that might linger a while, the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. neuropathy stuff. Yeah. And I'm doing a benefit for this hospital because some of the people who do the integrative medicine, mm. really great. And they're not really funded by the hospital that much. So we're going to do a benefit for them too. The hospital was great and uh, the people were great, but we wanted to do some things for the nurses. So in December, I'm doing a benefit with my keyboard player and singer. We're going to do this just because we want a lot of the volunteers to know that they've been appreciated. That's really nice, man. Put money into that side of it. people that are doing like, um, they do massage, they do Reiki, they do all these different kind of things that make the whole process a lot easier. Yeah, For, that's great, man. I'm you know, you're, what, what amazed me was you're, when you take your wife to the uh, infusion room, there's like 14 chairs and they're all full. You know, there's all these people that are going, so a lot of uh, doing worse than you, doing better than you, because everybody reacts different to chemotherapy. But it's better now than it used to be. And they're more specific. Uh, but yeah, it was rough. That was yeah. probably the darkest time. And uh, she also has, it's, um, uh, she's had this for a while. She has, um, what is it called? It's called star guards. It's like, sort of like macular degeneration, where she's going slowly going bl blind. And wow. Yeah. Uh, but that's been going on for the last 15, 20 years. But it's just, if she's on her own, like has to go to an airport, she has to use her cane just so they know she can't read the gates. Yeah. So those are some of the, you know, darker. She's great at this. No one would even know. Sure. You see her, you'd go, oh, she is going blind. I don't notice that. Yeah. So those are the, those are kind of the darker moments. Yeah. Man. I'm yeah. really glad she's okay. And thank yeah, you. Thanks. Man. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Wow. I always get emotional myself when I hear this because it's so, yeah, it's awful. Man. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one other thing. When uh, Phil Collins management, everybody was so great. They said, listen, if you, if, if you need any financial help, I said, you know, I'm fine. We're fine with that. But they were willing, they wanted to do that. And then there was, there was this one benefit that was coming up that Phil always does. It's called the Little Dreams Foundation. And it's, I always do it with him. He has the rhythm section of the band. And he was talking to everybody about that. And I said to him, you know, Phil, I, I, you know I would do it if I can. He goes, I understand. He says, you don't need to leave your house at this point. You know, he was real understanding. Yeah, it's really cool. He says, you know, just send Michaela. My, my wife's name is Michaela. He says, send her my love. And, you know, everybody's, that's the way that band is. And that's really up, nice, man. They help people out a lot. So, um, Do you know Steve Hunter? I don't, I don't know Steve Hunter, no. Do you know who he is? Yes. He's going blind. Is he really? No. Yeah, I had him on the show. One of the night stand up Midwestern guy. Mm -hmm. Stand up, really cool dude. Great work ethic. Um, and he is handling that situation with such incredible grace. I was uh uh blown away by how, you know, he even um the, his last solo record, man, it was kind of intense. It's called Before the Lights Go Out. And huh. the cover of it, wow. it's just, yeah, it's just a picture of his walking cane up against the light switch. It was intense. Just, I mean, he's just a class guy. And, and you know, it's, it's, I don't know the name of what he has, but it's a similar thing. It's, you know, kind of like it's been degenerating for quite some time and it's pretty bad now. And he's got to have a cane and the glasses and, you know, um, uh, my wife doesn't have to have a cane if I'm with her or anything, but if she's on her own at a airport, they help her, you know, it's yeah. that. Man, thank you for sharing. I'm really happy, really freaking happy. She's okay, man. She's really good. happy. She's doing well. It'll be good when, uh, I know Ann used to have, she used to, have to get markers every six months yeah. and, and then every year and then, you know, each passing season. But I will tell you, it took me, a little over five years till I 
didn't wake up every day thinking about that every day. Yeah. Yeah. And then I remembered when it, when it happened, cause it was like, it, I was happy, you know, but it, it, I was shocked how long it took, but, um, just to prepare you sort of. Yeah. Um, is there anything you seem like you've been really smart about things in your life in general, not that you had a perfect life, nobody does, but um, is there anything you'd go back, if there's any advice you can give a younger Daryl that you would have told yourself? Um, well, yeah, I don't have any real regrets. Hmm. I mean, because usually when regrets mean that things aren't going well for you now because of things you did. So I don't have... <laughs> Well, you know what I mean. It's yeah, it's, yeah. Like if you only regret it if it's bad now, like yeah, <laughs> if it led you to a place that was ultimately good, it's like okay, you know, shit happens, right? Yeah, yeah. And most of the things, career-wise and, and personally, have, have really worked out well. So mm -hmm. I don't have any specific regrets, but I mean, I mean, I think I could have made some things easier on myself. I mean, everybody talks about this. Like I, I, I wish that when I was younger, I wouldn't care so much if someone liked me. Yeah. You know, like you care so much what they think about you. Sure. It, it makes you not do certain things you, and try certain things. I wish I would have um, maybe sat in with more bands. You know, you just don't want to do that because I like to have control of my situation. Mm. So I can't control that. So I don't yeah. that. Now I'm a little looser with that today than I used to be. Yeah, that's good. I'm a lot easier with people than I used to be. You know, I, mm. I think also. Uh, being raised in Milwaukee, you have a, have this kind of sense that you're not good enough. In Milwaukee, why is that? Well, because it's not a city that's known for big things like big. You know, it's not New York, it's not yeah. Chicago, it's not L.A. Right. It's not London. It's Milwaukee. Yeah. Okay. I, I get. Love, it. As I a musician, it. I can understand that. I I I didn't know about it, but I can understand that. Yeah. Well, like a lot of musicians say, they have an inferiority complex here. Right. Yeah. Right. And there's actually been some pretty good musicians coming out of here. And, uh, you know, I mean, like, like I remember uh, my wife and I used to live above this bar. <laughs> it's just when we were first together the first three years. We lived above this bar. But below the bar, prior to us uh, moving there, Al Jarreau used to sing there because he's from Milwaukee. That's pretty cool. That's Great singer, you know. We've had some, some good musicians come out of here. And some people don't even know. You know, Leland Sklar, our bass player. Yeah. He was born in Milwaukee. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, it's just amazing. Our our trump, one of our trumpet players in uh, the Phil Collins band, his name is Danny Fornero, was born in right outside of Milwaukee. It's called Kenosha. Kenosha, and, I've heard of that actually. Yeah. And um, you know, Woody Herman was here. Liberace was from here. You know, there's all these these different players that I went, oh, that's right, they're Milwaukee guys too. And you almost have to focus in on that a little bit because realize you can make it, uh, if whatever making it is for you. Yeah. And. Uh, Anyway, so, uh, yeah, you do have this. That's why I was so surprised when George Duke liked my playing. Right. I thought maybe I'm good for Milwaukee. You know, I'm I, good for here. And, you know, it's interesting. I was listening and I was like, man, this guy really had a lot of courage how you handled all that stuff. I mean, I know that you were probably, you know, shitting your pants, but you didn't, you didn't think about that. You went and did the job. Yeah. You know, so I was really, I thought I was, I had a lot of respect and I was really impressed with that because at a, again, at a 20 year old kid, man, it's, that's a lot of pressure. Well, it surprises me that I did it too. <laughs> because, well, you did it, man. Well, you, you could sabotage your own career anytime. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I, I'm the, I'm the opposite. When you are raised in New York city, you're like, there's this famous uh, map that the New Yorker magazine has like, like a view of a New Yorker, like there's a little picture of New Jersey, like way out in the distance, a tiny dot, California, but like New York is the, you're very ethnocentric about where you're like, you know, you're kind of a little arrogant in a sense about where you come from. Cause it's like, well, it's not New York. So it does, you know, <laughs> you, which is, I don't know why it's, I think it's, at least I speak for myself. I think it was so rough in the seventies. It was. Yeah. It was real, and it's funny because when I have guys our age on here that are from New York, people often say, "Man, what is it with you and these New York guys? You have this vibe." And I'm like, "Man, we just survived. We're just grateful to be here." It was really a bad place to. to I'm, I remember when I used to go there when I was with Ponte and we'd be in New York. I was actually a little frightened. Yes. Yeah. Oh, how could you not be? 
yeah. Yeah, back in the late seventies, it was awful. That was when the, uh, the city was going bankrupt, the crack, all the drugs. I'll yeah. never forget. I like 75 through like the 80. I'm, I remember being there. It was Times Square was all prostitutes, drugs. I remember I started work when I was 14. I grew up in the Bronx. I used to take a bus and two subways downtown to work. And I was a messenger, a foot, you know, like you give me a package here and say, go deliver this is before fax machines, emails, all that. So they, that's what they did. And I'll never forget. I got off the bus and I'm on 42nd street. And I saw these two guys rob this woman's chain right in front of me. And another time I saw these guys beating each other. It was just, that, I, I, I can go on forever, but that's the way it was there. So you had a right to be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> and in certain areas of Milwaukee, it was the same thing. Yeah. I in 1970, I was playing in a nightclub and it was called Humboldt Gardens. And I was playing in this nightclub. It's a bad neighborhood. <clears throat> And I went out to the, my parked car with my amplifier by myself, open up the trunk, and I'm lifting my amp and putting it in there. And I, this car is kind of pulling up about 20 feet away. It was a Cadillac, and two guys were in it. And a guy walks out. They were kind of wearing, you know, this was the, the years of, like, Superfly and all this. Yeah, the leather. They were wearing, oh, there's, like, fur and hats. <laughs> and here's what I hear. I'm putting my, my uh, amp away, and the guy says to me, Hold it right there, you motherfucker. <laughs> I turned around and went, holy shit. He's, walk, he's walking toward me with a pistol aimed right at me. What, and it's amazing with the things that you say to yourself at this moment. You start going like, what am I going to do? I just went, boom. I just took off through the cars in the parking lot. And, and today, I think he'd be shooting at me. But he didn't. Wow. I just immediately let, I, you know, I, was, I shut the trunk and just split. And, you know, just really quickly. <laughs> I'll never Holy f- crap. That's something that stays around with you. It does. I mean, to this day, I, I remember that feeling. But when you turn around and you see that pistol aimed right at you, it looks like a huge gun. You know what I mean? Maybe it wasn't, but it sure wow. looked. And they must have just taken off then because I ran. And I thought, I'm not going to stick around for this. Because you say to yourself in here, if I stay here, they're going to take my amp, they're going to take my guitar, and they're going to probably hit me over the head with the, with the pistol. Yeah, yeah. But I think if that was today, it might have been boom, boom, boom. Yeah, there's no, it's, yeah, I would probably, yeah, today it seems like. Uh, yeah. Well, I got out of that. <laughs> so I was, I was lucky to get out of that. Oh, you certainly were, man. Good for you. Jeez. You must have been scared to death when to go back to your car. I remember running into the club, and I just, <sighs> and I had my girlfriend at the time was there, you know. Her name was Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I never that, it was, it was, and then the guys in the club just went out there with sawed-off shotguns, and they were saying, "Where are they?" You know, they. Oh, they, uh, okay. They're already gone. So anyway, that was my one rock. Wow. Yeah, that's the only time I get, it came close to being a rock. <laughs> um, let's shift gears for a few minutes. Let's talk about guitars. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> eventually we get to them. Um, do you still practice? I practice every day. Wow. What was the last thing you practiced? But, but, I'll, but I'll tell you what practice. Okay. The last thing I practiced was yesterday. Um, I, I, I went through the Phil Collins show. Oh, uh, okay. You know, we, we have like the songs we're going to play on this next. I'm leaving in one week from today. Uh, mm-hmm. from yesterday. No, right. I'm leaving on Monday, actually. And um, uh, I was um, just going through the whole show. He sends us the MP3s of what we're going to do, and then I just play along with it. That's the last thing. But that's not the only thing I did yesterday. And then when I, when I watch television, I have a guitar in my hands, a, 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 usually a Strat, mm. and not plugged in, and I'm just noodling constantly. <laughs> Is it I, anything specific or...? It's pretty much noodling around and playing in certain keys and just here's G minor, so I play. Okay. I don't I don't practice uh, scales. I don't practice any of that. I just play, and it could be. And then when my my girls were younger, uh, when they were like you know eight years old or whatever, and they used to go, and I used to play along with the commercial. And he said, <laughs> "How come you know that commercial?" Said, oh, I've heard it a couple times, so I can play that commercial. You know, you just. So I'm constantly, they got, uh, my wife, 
it must not bother her because she doesn't hear it anymore. I'm just going to, you know, you know what a, a, yeah. a guitar that's not plugged in sounds like. It's, you can still hear it, but it's oh. not loud. They just got used to it. So I, I, I also, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I apologize. No, I play all the time. I, I'm, I've got a guitar. I got a guitar right next to me. And, you know, um, I'm just noodling around while I'm doing something. Yeah, I need to do, I, my, I don't watch TV and does, but she's always watching it in bed and I can't like bring a guitar <laughs> into bed. It's just too, we I've tried. It's just like, it's not comfortable. It's weird. It's like, then I got the neck sticking out over on her side. She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't bring it into bed, bed, but I, it's always, I'm, I sit on the couch and I, yeah. I play. And my, my wife sits on another chair and watches TV. She has to sit closer because of her eyes. So she has to sit. Yeah. That makes it. sense. So I just sit back there and just noodle. <laughs> what, what's your go-to guitar nowadays? Like, what, what do you what do you like playing the most? The one you know to pick up the. This may sound self-serving, but I, I like the guitar that was made for me. Let's talk about it, man. Okay, it's it's a by the company Godin Guitars, and um, they they approached me about wanting to do a signature guitar. And now the reason why they that came about. Is I, I was playing a, a Godin LGXT. That was that's a guitar that has um, not only magnetic pickups on it like humbuckers, it also has a pickup for an acoustic sound and also like a MIDI kind of uh, control for a synthesizer. And I thought I was going to get into it, but I didn't get into that too much using it. But I really like the guitar itself, the sound. And so I talked to them about this, and I. They said, well, why don't we make you a signature guitar based on the LGXT? And I, I mean, I'll show you. It's yeah, man, let me see it. It's, 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 uh, it's the same body and everything on an LGXT. So it's the same body, same neck. But okay, I so let me, let me just describe to, in case people are listening, not watching it. Okay, it, it looks like a kind of like a Les Paul body. It really is like a Les Paul as far as sound wise as well. Um, you know, it's, it's two pickups. And, um, but I also, you know, the, the LGXT had a lot of controls, a lot of extra things. I wanted something simple. Yeah. I have one volume control, one tone control, and then you got your toggle switch, which, you know, you can make them single coil pickups or, or double coil pickups, which is what they are. I also, um, there's a little button you can't see probably here. Right. It's called the HDR. That's the high definition revoicer. What that does is it makes the pickups active. So, oh, man. Yeah, so it's kind of cool because sometimes you're playing along and maybe just for your solo, you might want to kick in a little bit more high end, a little more volume. You hit that switch and that does it. That's really cool. Right, and, that, and they were starting to put the HDR switches on a lot of their guitar. How does that, how do they make it? So there's a preamp in there. There's a preamp in there. What's really cool is, you know, like I have another guitar that has, has to have a battery in it. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to, th is there a battery in there? Yeah, there is. But what's really cool is if your battery goes out, your guitar still works. It, then it just goes back to the regular pickups. Uh, oh, it switches to, to, okay. Like I have another guitar. I have a, um, it was an Eric Clapton Strat, which has a battery in it too. And if the battery goes out, your guitar stops. <laughs> yeah. So is that with the EMG? Uh, um, these are uh, these are um, uh, these are Seymour Duncan pickups. No, your Strat is that with the EMG oh. Oh. Uh, that has no. the whole pick guard with the active pickups? Well, these are the lace. Those are lace sensor pickups. Okay, okay. And the other thing on this one, and I, I did different tuners on here. They're called Ratio, and I like those tuners better. Uh, Godin also does their own tremolo. Or I, it's really a vibrato bar, not a tremolo bar. You know, um, they so it's do, more like a like a Bigsby Plus. Yeah. Well, what it does is um, you can control where this arm lands on the back of the guitar. There's a little thing you just a little adjustment with an Allen key, and you just put you put this like right. Say if you want it to land right here, then you just tighten it in the back, and it'll always land. Oh, that's that cool. Yeah, but my I have it down here, so. That's like one of those little creature comfort things that people don't usually think about. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, they, it's called uh, the Godin True Lock. So you can lock this into wherever you want it to land. I like it to be a little bit loose, but not like waving around. So I play, and then you play some. And then you can get it out of your way. 
until uh, it's in place. But anyway, that's the guitar body and the guitar neck and the pickups are the same as the Godin LGXT, but everything else is different. It's a different tremolo, uh, <laughs> vibrato bar, and it's a different, it's one volume, one control, HDR pick. It's really, I really love, love this. It's my go-to guitar, and it's not just because it's mine. I actually wanted this guitar because I made it for myself. And it's, it's a good guitar. Um, it's not an ebony fingerboard. It's called Rich Light. Okay. Which is, that's what they're doing more of now because uh, it's like ebony as far as the same look and the same basic sound. Um, is, yeah. that, is that neck thick or, or thin? Uh, you said you're 5'8", but you have really long fingers for a guy who's 5'8". That's un, like unusually long. I don't know if I would consider that. It's, it's pretty much the same as a strat. Okay. So, it's, so to me, strat necks are thinner necks, I li I, which I like. Yeah, it, it's, it's fine. But um, yeah, because I, I don't even know if it's fat or thick <laughs> for me. I don't know. Yeah. But, and the other go-to guitar that I have is... Uh, one more question. Sorry, Darryl. What kind of pick? You said those are Duncans in there? What, which, do you know which ones? Uh, this, uh, one is called like Jazz. They're, they're, I, I can't remember the actual technical names for them. No worries. Yeah, but there's Seymour Duncan, and they're really nice pickups. Uh, yeah, it even says Seymour Duncan. I didn't know if it said Godin on them, but it says Seymour Duncan. That's cool. Really pretty guitar, and color-wise, uh, what? Yeah, it's, 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 it's just it's dark, a, it's trans, red, trans, red. trans red. Really pretty guitar, man. Yeah, thank you. And, and, you know, and it's really a comfortable guitar. But and, and I say it sounds more like a um, Les Paul than than say a Strat. But if mm. you put it in single coil, it'll sound more like a Strat. That's great, man. So it's, That's, it's, it's a nice thing. It's called the DS One, the Daryl Sturmer One. Where is that? Like, let's just do a little pitch for that. Where would people get that? Do they have to call Godan for that, or is they in dealers? Well, I noticed that on their website, you can actually buy it right from their website. Um, okay. That um, you have to just go to a dealer that deals with Godan guitars. Okay. They say, oh, uh, it looks like Godin, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's Godin. It's G O D I N. In case people are wondering. And and you know they're they're a company out of uh, Montreal, Canada. Hmm. They're really great people to work with. I know Robert Godin. He's the one that started the company. He's, I, I think he's sort of like semi-retired right now, but his sons are running it and they're running it really well. I was just down at the NAMM show in Nashville. You know what? Mario told me that. Yeah. I didn't, I was there just for a cup for like the first day. I didn't see you, but I didn't know you then anyway, but uh, oh. yeah, I, I was there. It was, it was I fun. I didn't go to the first day. I went to the second and third day. Okay. And then I played at the booth. I just played. If you, if you go on YouTube, you can see. Uh, that actually somebody from Premier Guitar, they did a video and interview with me and I did some playing. Oh, was it John? Big tall guy? Yeah. Yeah, I forgot, his, I forgot his last. Uh, John Bollinger. Yeah, that must be who it was. Wait, wait, no. Uh, I can't remember his name. It was offhand. Yeah, it probably was John. John does most of them. Real tall, slim guy. Slim guitar player? Yeah. Has he got dark hair? Oh, no, maybe he's a premier guitar. I don't know. Is it, I thought he was one of them. He's got real dark hair, yeah. Yeah, premier guitar. Uh, this, I, I, know, I think I know who you're talking about, but I think this was this other guy. I can't okay. okay. Sorry. No, no, it's all good. Uh, the other guitar that I, I go to, and I use it also on the Phil Collins tour, is my, my Strat. It, it was at one time an Eric Clapton Strat, but I've changed the neck on it to a, the neck that used to be on there was a, a V-shaped hmm. neck, which is much more of a, like a retro and thin frets. I changed it to a modern C with um, medium jumbo frets. Man, the new Strat necks, I feel, they're great. Yeah, the new uh, ones are great. They're really nice, man. I, you know, it's, it's so easy to play. And, and I would show it to you, but it, uh, my equipment was picked up uh, on Monday. <laughs> for, for the tour upcoming. Sure, so all of that's gone. But I, I have about four... Uh, of my DS1, so I could show you that. That's cool, man. That's congratulations on the signature guitar. That's really nice, man. Well earned. Great, great company, really easy people to work with. Um, do you are you a collector? Like, do you have a bunch of guitars? I have a bunch of guitars, but I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a collector. Um, uh, one of my other favorite guitars I have is a uh, a Gibson uh, 335. I love. I see you. I think you have one right behind you. Yeah, man. I, this is all I've been playing lately. I'm trying to make this my main. I just love this thing, man. It feels yeah. great. I'm not a big guy either, and I don't have big hands, but this is a slim neck. 
Mm -hmm. It's like a 60s neck, I guess. Okay. I just love this thing, man. I yeah. really like it. It's got the 57 you know, it's a, it's a mod, it's a new guitar. It's a 2014. It looks vintage okay. because I bought it from a guy who works at Gibson. Oh, wow. So he put the Bigsby on and he slapped this custom made sticker. So it looks vintage, but it's not, it's like a 14. Okay. I love, I love, love this guitar. Man. Well, that's one of my favorite guitars that I have too. Um, I, you know, I don't play it on the Collins show or anything like that, but occasionally I will play it on, on recordings. You know, I, I, some stuff I just leave in my house. Yeah. I don't take it out anywhere, but um, that's one of my favorite guitars I have. I, I have several strats. You know, I have ba a different basses because I play with Genesis. I have a Yamaha bass. I have a Lakeland bass. I have a Godin two, a five string and a four string Godin basses, you know. How much I, bass are you playing? Probably about 50%. Oh, quite a bit. Yeah, I'll tell you something. When I started wow. bass with them was in 1978. It really took me literally five years to really feel comfortable as a bass guitarist. It takes a long time. I mean, you can't, yeah, you can play with a pick and play. I still play with pick or fingers. I do either one, depending on the song. But it took a long time to really feel where the bass lays, hmm. tracks, you know. So I, I feel fairly confident on, on bass now, but um, I haven't played it in, in since the last Genesis tour, which was 2007. So okay. if they if they want to go on tour again, I'm going to have to start practicing bass again. Yeah, well, you will. It's, it's, yeah. I'm sure you got the muscle memory for doing it after. The other thing, I bet too, you're you took you five years because of the level of your frame of reference was your guitar playing. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, like it wasn't like the average listener sitting in the audience. What would you know what I mean? You're looking at your guitar player as a certain standard. So I'm assuming you say, okay, well, <laughs> I don't have much wiggle room around that for my bass playing, you know, so. Well, you know, I play with this Leland Sklar, who is one of my favorite bass players. Yeah. You know, playing with Tony Levin. And, oh my God. Yeah, that's, well, that's not reasonable comparison. <laughs> far though, you know, that's what you go for. Yeah, I totally get that, man. Uh, who, who is some, I'm sure over the years you've played with a lot of people at came on the stage any favorites doesn't have to be guitar or anything Could sure be anything. uh well one time i was on a break from a genesis tour this would have been um probably like 1980 early 80s maybe it was yeah i think it was like 80 and uh i was in the nightclub where my band plays i wasn't with the band anymore but i'll come and sit in and and jaco was there jaco pastorius wow somebody had brought him in so he he took my brother's bass. I played guitar, and I was like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> you know, Jocko just blows me away. But I will tell you, the first thing he did, he played drums first. He sat in on drums. We did the song called "Chameleon" by Herbie Hancock, and he played this feel, and he sounded like a drummer. And then he gets on my brother's bass, and he's like unbelievable. You know, he just thinking, "Holy!" Uh, then after that, we went. It was me and Jocko and the sax player of the band that I worked with, his name was Warren Wiegratz. We went over to this radio station after, after we played that night, because it's a nighttime jazz show called The Dark Side. Oh, that sounds awesome. Ron Kuzner and The Dark Side. His name is <laughs> and he's sitting there, and so we got Jocko and me and Warren, and we're sitting by this mic, and Ron, is, Ron was a real more traditional jazz guy. And he said to uh, Jocko, he said, you know, I know that you're a fan of Herbie Hancock, but he says, do, do you feel like he's sold out or anything doing this? Uh, he, he did an album called Headhunters. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah, great album. But more commercial than some of the traditional jazz. He says, what do you feel about that? And Jocko is so funny. He leans into the mic and he goes, you got to eat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's what he's probably got 60 albums. Like, come on. I mean. Well, that was so, we just broke out laughing. He's a tremendous, incredible musician, Herbie Hancock. My God. Yeah, so, I mean, you know. I, you got to eat. That's so funny. Great he, answer. Yeah, it, it is. And he's one, of my, he's one of my favorite guys I've ever played with. I, I, I played with, um, <laughs> I just actually just last week, two weeks ago, there was a thing called the Fresh Coast Jazz Festival here. And with Lee Rittenauer. Oh, yeah. And I've known Lee since 1975. When I was doing that George Duke session, the first album I ever did, the next session was with Lee Rittenauer. And I got to, <laughs> when I met, 
I've known him ever since. Whenever he comes into town or I go into LA, we stay at his house or I, anyway, I just played with him uh, just last at the Fresh Coast Jazz Festival. I think it's two weeks ago now. That's cool, man. Great player, you know, just a wonderful, and that, I don't think that's on YouTube. Um, I, have a, I have a film of it. My wife took the film. Um, played with J, uh, David Sanborn one time. He, when the Phil Collins went out with the, uh, it was called the Phil Collins Big Band in around 2000. We played in Europe, and David Sanborn uh, played with us, and it was just, pff, he's just a great player. Another, another real thing for, in my history, for me, is I really enjoyed this. Back in, I think it was 1983 or four, uh, we did a concert, uh, Genesis did a concert, with Peter Gabriel singing with us. And it was called, because uh, it, was, it, was, it was at a place called Milton Keynes outside in. I know exactly where that is. I've been there. Yeah, and it was a big concert with you know thousands of thousands of people, and we did all old Genesis music with Peter singing and Phil playing drums. That must have been really cool. It was great. It was just great. That those are some moments I really, I really enjoyed playing with certain musicians, and Peter is one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, you know, just his music. I think Genesis and Peter are great. I think I think Genesis is better. Without Peter, I think Peter's better with yeah. Not yeah. meaning that, that they would drive, but they got so much more successful on their own. Yeah. They, 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 they were able to do what they do best without yeah. each other. I totally get it, man. Yeah. No, that's not. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big Peter fan. He's incredible, man. He may, he's um, he's inc an incredible musician, man. And what's great is that was not a bad breakup. These, aren't, these are people who still really like each other a lot. There's no animosity towards that at all. They just did great on their own. The, Phil became a better, better singer, better musician, when, you know, when he had to. This is a very unique situation, the way you've described this, where you're very rare. I mean, these, these guys all are in long-term relationships with their spouses, partners, whatever. Long-term band relationships, good relationships with former band members this is a, a very unique maybe one of the only situations like this where there's not this you know animosity or acrimony and everybody's like you know i mean i hear stories of other bands you know right. all i don't know going to names but you hear them you know the you know that they've been together but only two of them are left everybody else they hate it and when this guy died this guy came in they really hated him they shoot him off really this is really a not it's nice to hear that that this is like a connection that really worked and, and i'm happy well, for you we were, <laughs> well, we were on the last uh phil collins tour that we were doing uh the last one we just did the last leg was in europe and what was great is we had mike and the mechanics opening the show <laughs> the first half of the tour that and is cool. then mike would come up and play follow you follow me with us because we, we, do, we do uh three genesis songs we do follow you follow me and we do invisible touch and we do what's the other one we do um oh we throwing it all away okay and mike came up and did follow you follow me with us and it was just great and uh you know he's such a great guy to work with and um i you know he's such a good friend of mine and to have them open for us to have them be fine with each other i mean because Genesis hasn't really broken up. It just stopped touring, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it, it, and I went on tour with Mike. I, uh, one day I got a call uh, from the management and this was like about three, four years ago, maybe three, four. And, uh, and Tony Smith, the manager says to me, he says, I have Mike here in the office. He says, uh, he would like to ask you if you would maybe like to open Mike and the Mechanics tour. We're going to be touring the U.S. And I went, really? I said, do you want my band? And he said, no, just you. And I said, what do you mean, just me? He said, you know, do like your solo thing. He says, because because I've done like seminars where I put a computer up and I play along with the tracks. <laughs> and, and I thought, yeah, but I didn't do that like to a, a, a theater audience, you know, like 500 to 1,800 people. Yeah. I just did it to like 30 to 50. He says, no, I think that'll be great. <laughs> so I, I decided I would do it because 
it was a challenge, you know, and yeah. it's, but, and I thought I could regret this. We always talk about stuff like that. Like, could I, should I have done that or should I have not done that? And what, what did I get out of it? And I ended up, what was great, the first night we did was not a theater, which made it easier. It was a, a club in Annapolis, Maryland called Ram's Head. And I had already uh, heard of, played or a long, long time ago played at the Ram's Head. But anyway, so I go up on stage and thank God it's an audience of about 350. And I feel okay with that. Which I is feel, still up to experiment. It's yeah. It's, you know, you got to take a deep breath, I'm sure. I thought, it's still going to work. Because what I have on my computer is drum machine. I played bass and, and I played keyboards on there. I sequenced keyboards, but I played the bass. And I tell the audience that right away because I'm not right. trying to pull wool over their eyes. And it worked. I got a standing right. ovation. Then we played a theater the next night and it was fine. It worked every night. And I, was, I only did 30 minutes, which is like about four songs. Cause I, but I tell stories in between. I tell the audition story with Mike. That, I tell all of that. And that, that's what makes it work. Oh, it, hell yeah. Almost like a lecture seminar. Yeah. Just, you know, and that's how I do my seminars. But you've had such a long career and people are there. They're familiar with you. I think <laughs> they would rather hear that than an extra song, to be honest. I mean, the engagement you get out of that is off the charts. And uh, what uh, Mike the only thing Mike said to me, he says, just don't do any Genesis songs. And I said, I won't. <laughs> stuff. I, I do a Jeff Beck song. I do Freeway Jam by Jeff Beck. I do oh, man, great song. Instrumental versions, of course. I don't sing. And I do Message in a Bottle. Great song. All my own stuff. And uh, one day I was playing um, a, a song. I wanted Mike to hear. I did a, I did a recording of which will come out of my next record. Um, Oh, no, it's on the record I'm just having out now. It's called, um, it's a Genesis song called Just the Job to Do. But it's an instrumental version. And I played it for Mike just to let him hear it. I, said, I just wanted you to hear this version of the Genesis song. And he says, after he hears it, goes, that really works. He says, why don't you play it on, you know, when you're doing the opening for me? I said, but you said not to do any Genesis. He says, yeah, but no one will know that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I think this is the job to do, no one knows what the song is. Right. But when you you'll you'll remember it you'll go oh i've heard that song because it was out on the radio but it wasn't a big hit that's great man so it all worked out it worked out great i did uh, about three and a half weeks with uh with mike and had a great time we just went by bus it was much different than you know genesis tours or phil console we're always private plane and all that but this was a bus tour and it was really one wonderful guys anton uh, Anto's great. great. What, he's he don't play any bad notes. That guy, man, he's no. really melodic. And see, with with uh, Mike, he plays bass as well. So when, when, oh. Mike, when Mike's playing guitar, he's playing bass. Same kind of thing with me. Okay, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he's a very nice guy too. Do, I don't forget. Did you get to spend some time with him? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, he's, enough, I mean, we're doing like long trips. You know, he's a great Irishman. Great guy. We I think we we have the same birthday, which is odd. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's really funny. Uh, do you remember the first album you bought? Um, I think so. You know, I, I think it's the first album I bought was by the animals. Oh, well, the animals <laughs> had house of the rising sun on it. That was a big song for me because when I was first learning guitar, I wanted to learn that song so bad. Now, the reason why I play guitar <clears throat> is because my brother was a musician before me. He was, he was playing guitar and singing in a band. And, you know, you admire your older brother. And so I want to be like him. But I was the quiet kid. I'm not quiet anymore. But yeah, I, was, definitely. I was really an introverted kid. And um, I started playing guitar. I started learning. And he would show me stuff on the guitar. And that's so I played guitar because of him. And, and he ended up becoming a bass player because I passed him up on the guitar technically and and he just started playing bass after he got out of vietnam that's really cool. yeah he came home and obviously he's he's a really good singer and he and he's a good musician and he said I'm, i'll just start playing bass so he learned bass and it became a really good bass player so that's um but anyway that gets back to the song um house of the rising sun and to learn that song was a real feat you know, because you're sitting here. Is, can I play it? Yeah, dude, please. I, I think every baby boomer 
that plays guitar has played that song. It's such yeah. a great song, man. I am really happy you're picking up your guitar, man. Thanks. Well, okay. I, I let me see if I am. Right. Wait a minute. Are we gonna get are we gonna get nailed on publishing here? <laughs> is is the uh, Can I play? Uh, play a few bars, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if you well, know, I've heard. But when I first, you know, when you, you know, the song. Yeah. A minor C, yeah. But when I played it back then, it was like this. <laughs> and then, and then you go to the F and it goes. And you got. Uh, it goes, you know. Right. And beautiful that was, song, man. That's a wonderful riff. The guitar player's name was Hilton Valentine. Was that the name of the guy who played guitar on that? Yeah. Hilton Valentine. Wait a minute. <laughs> what a great name. I think that's his name. <laughs> God, I hope I'm right on that one. I'm going to look that up. Yeah, look it up to make sure, because I want to <laughs> be right on that. I hope I'm right. That's what I remember anyway. Hilton Valentine. Hilton Valentine. I'm going to look it up, and I'll send you an email. I'll let you know. Okay, good. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was one of the first songs I learned. Another song was called Rumble. By oh, uh, 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 yeah. Great song, man. So those are the, that's those early songs you learn. Yeah, great song. Do you know Stevie Salas? I, I don't. He made a movie uh, about American, Native American Indians because he's Native American. And uh, it talked a lot of, I think Dwayne Eddy was, Oh, Native American, and it was a lot of it about that, you know, just all the music, which is interesting. Yeah, Desert Island Discs top three knee jerk reaction. Just for now, man, I know I could ask you this in 10 minutes, it'd be uh, uh songs. Well, you mean Another, no I, records, not songs. Sorry, was that mean like if you were on a, a desert island, what would you have? You well, mean? you know, some people take it literally. I, I always take it to mean what's your top three favorite records. But a lot of guys say, well, if I was on a desert island, I would need this, this, and this. So I think it depends what you're, how anal you are. So you yeah. could interpret that however, whatever feels right. I, I think, because I don't really listen to a lot right now, because when you're doing your own stuff, you're listening to your own stuff. But if I, if I was, what records I would love to take with me, there's a record by Weather Report called Heavy Weather. Man, that's been that's come up as a favorite a number of times. Oh, that's great. Sergeant Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band, The Beatles, mm -hmm. another real favorite for me. Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced? Yeah, I love that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's there's really, I would I bring Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. You know, I just love that. Um, you know, as far as these are some old records that I've had forever. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's, God, there's, someone, there's an album I really love, and it's not old, old. Uh, it's by Bruce Hornsby, and it's called Intersections. And it's one, two, three. I think it's f three or four CDs in there. And I like everything on it. <laughs> everything. I, I just love his piano playing. And I would, I would bring, a, you know, anything by Wes Montgomery uh, and his jazz records. Not so much his pop records, but his jazz records. You know, I mean, it's. I mean, you know, I would hate to have to pick. Yeah, but, you know, that's, a, that's why I always, it's a tough question. Yeah. Do you know George Marinelli by any chance? I don't know. No. That's Bruce's guitar player. Oh, oh, yeah, well, him, I'll meet him then. Yeah, I had him on the show a long time. Really nice guy. Yeah, I've seen, I've, anytime I've seen him play, he was probably the guitar player. Back in the day, yeah, he's not with him now. He's with yeah. Bonnie Ray. He's been Bonnie's guitar player for about 20 years now, but uh, yeah. super nice guy. And there was a bass player with him that's an actually a Milwaukee bass player named Joe Porta. And he oh, was, yeah, he was, uh, what was, he founded? Ambrosia. Ambrosia, right. Yeah. He's still with Ambrosia too, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. I had, he has a studio here in Milwaukee. And, uh, really? I didn't know he was from Milwaukee. Yeah. I, I think he's from Milwaukee, but he's, he's actually at least lived here forever. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Cause I had Doug Jackson from Ambrosia. On okay. the show. he's been you know their guitar player for again 20 years or something like that well joe was uh in the original um bruce Horns be in the range i did not the, know that all those the, the way it is all those songs i did not know that um good play, good player <clears throat> yeah he's a good player daryl best decision that you ever made 
uh, to be honest, I, I probably getting married. Good man. No, because, you know, I don't know what I'd be doing if I wasn't, you know what I mean? You, you can, you can easily go off the rails, <laughs> you know, without help from somebody else or yeah. especially someone as stable as my wife is. Yeah. It helps to have somebody like that in your corner, man. I think I feel the same way. My, you're, you're, a, you know, you, you can make each other better people. That's mm -hmm. really cool. And yeah. she's funny and, I, and we make each other laugh, you know, which is great, especially important now after all these years. Cause I know you're, you, I see it. Everybody's divorced pretty much, yeah. you know, and, and I'm like, I'm, I'm very grateful that same thing. We just make each other laugh still, which is awesome. Most important things you've learned about yourself. Uh, that I've learned about myself. <clears throat> well, okay. I will, that I'm, I'm actually a very patient person and I'm getting more patient as I get older. I just don't let the things bother me or I don't have to get them done right now. And I used to be a little bit more that way. So that's great. Yeah. It's funny because I sometimes not often more or more often than not, people say what you just said, Oh, really? Okay. but occasionally I get a guy, Oh, I can't tolerate anything anymore. And I get that, but not tolerating it and then not getting upset about it is you know, usually it's more like what you said. I don't tolerate the same amount of stuff, but it doesn't bother me either anymore. Right. Yeah. But once in a blue moon, oh, I really get bothered. I'm like, whoa, man, you're getting old. You got to let that <laughs> go, man. You know? Well, I know, but we, we can get through it now. We know that. Yeah. We, it's we like the dark times. We can get through it, you know. And, you know, the way politics are today, everybody's at each other, and we can get through this too. Of course, man. That shouldn't be an, an issue. Are are you good with balancing like your business, your music and your personal life? I think I am. I, yeah, I seem really balanced. To be honest with you. It's also easier now because I'm not as busy as I used to be. Um, you know, like going out with, we've been going out for the last two and a half years uh, with the, and, you know, Phil Collins said that he was retiring. Remember? <laughs> this was about yeah. Two years ago. And, and I thought, how is he going to retire? He's going to get so bored. And he got bored. And what happened is we started going, doing things. And so about two and a half years now, we've been going on a tour, doing about four to five weeks, and then coming home for three months, and then going out again. It makes it a lot easier to balance. But I, I had to do that balancing act a little more difficult back when my kids were younger. Yeah, you know? I'm sure. Yeah, it was a little harder then, but I think it worked. You know, it's, it seems like it's worked out. I have so much respect for you guys because I think on the surface people don't realize how difficult your job is. And, oh, these guys are on stage, but man, as you know, as dozens and dozens of people have told me, Craig, I would do that for free, but to put up with all the other bullshit, you got to pay me. That's what you pay for. Yeah, you know the okay, travel, yeah. the practice, the sound. Yeah. yeah, that that's really true, and um, you know, and. I, I have, you know, I have two daughters and they're now 31 and 39 wow. two granddaughters that are two and a half and five. Congratulations. And, yeah. And, you know, they turn out great. I mean, I can, my one that's a, a mother, you know, I think, wow, she turned out to be such a great mother. Kelly, her name is, and my other daughter is Fiona. And, uh, you know, they don't seem like that when I used to go on tour, they always knew I was coming back. Yeah. And sometimes we'd have them come out. They, they actually really liked the whole music thing, if you want to call it, not the business, but they loved coming out to the concerts. They loved how they were treated by guys in the band or Genesis especially was a band that's real welcoming. They looked like, Oh, bring them out, you know, fine. Cause they would do the same thing. Mike and Tony especially would bring out their wives, sometimes their kids. Then we bring out our kids and they all became friends. That's nice, man. And now they're all like grownups now that stay in touch with each other on Facebook and Instagram and all this. It's really, really great. It's a, that is nice, man. A real family band. And uh, it's harder to do that with the Phil Collins band because there's a total of 15 of us uh, with him in the band. And uh, you can't bring families out because, you know, the plane is crowded with enough. We already have about 25 of us. on. Oh, wow. That is a lot of people on a plane. Yeah, I mean, because you got management and you got all, all, some extra people that are on. Um, crew and everybody 
is separate. They, they fly differently or they go on trucks or buses. But the band and the band entourage is with us. But you can't have, everybody can't bring out their wives or husbands or whatever. Because we, we have two of our uh, singers are female. And you know, they would love to bring their husband out too, but you can't do it. Yeah. But anyway, I think I think I balanced it pretty well. And, yeah. you know, I knew a lot of, about my wife, how she handled it with the children. Right. You know, like that right. made the difference. Best childhood memory besides um, besides getting held up outside of the happy yeah. happy times. I forgot the name of the place. <laughs> I think I think actually uh, when I used to, my my grandfather used to have a farm, and my oh. brother used to go out to the farm all the time, and I think every weekend we'd be out at the farm. I think that's my most fun time. That's really cool. Like a dairy farm. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Wisconsin Dairy Farm. <laughs> yeah, man. Imagine that. That's nice. Really cool. <laughs> and they had, you know, the the two German shepherds, and uh, we would always go for walks. One one time we were going out from my brother and I were out in the woods, and he saw this big rug. So he picks up this rug, and all these bees come out. Oh wow! All over us, and I'm probably eight years old, and he's ten, and he's swatting his hands, and he starts running. Bees are following him, and I'm standing with bees on me, and I'm crying. I'm just standing there crying. And uh, all of a sudden, he, he gets back to the farmhouse, and my, my parents come running out. He go, just walk towards us, and I have to walk real slow, and I'm just crying. I didn't get stink, stung once. Wow. I didn't swat at the bees. I was just so petrified. I just stood, stood still. My brother got bee stings all over him because he was swatting them, and then he was running, and they were chasing him. <laughs> And wow, uh, that's not like a, a fond memory I have. Of, uh, no, I, I, I get it's not. It's nostalgia. Yeah, it's nostalgia. Yeah, I so, get that. Um, being out at the farm was probably my most fun. Really cool. Who, who's had the biggest influence on you musically and also personally? Probably my brother, because um, he got me started. And even though he's not like in it now, like he used to be, my brother lives on an island off of Panama City. Down of Panama. Here? It's an island called Taboga Island. I didn't even know there was an island. In, I know. It's northern Florida. That's beautiful there. Oh, this, this, yeah, but this is Panama. Oh, Panama. There's yeah. Panama City up in northern Florida. Correct, I corrected myself. I meant Panama. not. Oh, in Panama. Wow. And it's, it's an island off of Panama, and it's a 45-minute uh, ferry ride. Uh, yeah, they, they have to take a boat. And there's only 900 people on this time. He's a real uh, nature kind of guy. So him and his wife live on this island where, where it's just like, it really is like Gilligan's Island. You know what I mean? It's just. How did you find out about that? Like. He, he's that way. He was always a nature guy. Right. And he was in environmental studies. He knows how to work all this stuff. He's retired now. But he just plays bass a little bit. He's not a musician he used to be or anything like that. But. Uh, I admire that he he's just doing what makes him happy. Yeah. And so he had a big influence on me because he was the bigger brother. He played before I did. He got me interested in guitar playing. I would say that's probably the biggest influence. That's awesome. <clears throat> Most important thing your dad taught you? Um, <laughs> he got me started on drums. <laughs> really? Because he played drums in the Navy band. and uh, But he was like in New Guinea uh, when he was in the Navy. But he started playing drums. So he bought me a snare drum one day and started teaching me drums. This was before I played guitar or trumpet when I was playing trumpet in high school. So I think that kind of got me interested in music. That's Even great. Brother, in a sense, you know. Most important thing your mom taught you? Um, I would say, uh, what's the right word? It's, it's um, oh, work ethic, basically. She's a real, and she worked in a nursing home. And uh, not as a nurse, but just as a person that worked there. But um, always finish the job. <laughs> you know, that's what I got out of her, pretty much. And she's, they're still alive, both of them. They're uh, 93 years old. Man, congratulations. That is great to hear. That's and they, really cool. Uh, they, uh, the car, uh, if I take the car over there every Sunday, it's, they live at an assisted living now. And, uh, you know, my dad's kind of failing now, you know, with dementia. But my mother's not at all. She reads a book a week. Wow. And 
she even read Phil Collins' book. I don't know if you heard that Phil Collins has a book. No, I did not. I will, I will recommend it because, but get the audio book. Okay. Is it him narrating? It's him narrating. Oh, so, very yeah. cool. And, and I, I, my mother actually read the actual book. And I said, what did you think? And she said, well, I thought I could have mentioned you more than six times. <laughs> that's, that's cute, man. What was good about the book for me is the first, I would say, quarter of the book I knew nothing about because that was his childhood. Then he gets into the stuff after being in Genesis. And, and I knew a lot of the stuff in the middle, but not a lot of the details. And then at the end, I didn't know a lot of the stuff that happened to him in the last uh, 10 years because I wasn't hanging out with him. He wasn't touring. And he got, you know, had to go into rehab a couple times. These are all things he said in the books. That's why I can say them. Yeah, of course. And, uh, the stories were like, oh, my God, I didn't had no clue this was going on. And, uh, you know, and his failing divorces, uh, his, you know, fa failing marriages, I mean. And um, they tend to go hand in hand, man. Re yeah. Drugs and that kind of stuff. I'll tell you, he, um, but he, he's such a fighter. It's just unbelievable. But um, I would recommend a book. Having him narrate the book is just makes such a difference. My wife started listening to it. We were driving from Milwaukee to Cleveland to visit um, her mother. And, um, we just started listening to it and it was like, we would pull over and go, uh, are you going to go on? I have to go to the bathroom, but let's, let's hold the book. right. <laughs> so it's really good. It was really good. I, I really, I was impressed. I didn't know he was such a good writer and he actually wrote the book. Oh, he did. It's not having another, he had another guy help him with the editing and putting it together. But it was his words. That's really cool. I'm going to definitely check it out. Yeah. The audio is really, really good. Favorite place you've traveled and favorite venue you've played in? I know you've been all over the world. Um, probably, because there's so many places I really like. Uh, but probably one of my favorite cities, because I spent uh, some time there, is Prague. Interesting. Yeah, and, and what happened is <clears throat> we were on a Phil Collins tour. This would have been probably 2004. And we were going to play Prague, but he got so sick, he couldn't, couldn't sing. My wife and her uh, girlfriend were coming over, and, and um, just to, they were going to stay, but I didn't have to play. We were going to be there for two nights, so I didn't have to play for those two nights. We had to cancel the show, but stayed in Prague for four nights total. So it came in the night before. We're supposed to play two shows, didn't, and then we had another night off the next night. The, uh, the, the, the end of that part of the story, though, is that we actually came back with the band and played after at the end of the tour to redo the tour, to That's redo. Good. But what a beautiful city that is. And it's actually a very affordable city. I mean, the, to have a beer in Prague is like a dollar. You know, they is, speak English there. A lot of people do. Yes. Yeah. I mean, most people speak English. Um, yeah, it's the, the Czech Republic, isn't it? So, um, I mean, I love Paris. I mean, I love, I mean, there's so many places. But the venue, um, I, one that sticks out in my mind is in 2007 with Genesis, we played a show in Rome. It was an open free show. It had 500,000 people. It was called Circus Maximus, this area. It's not a, it's not a stadium because there's no stadium that holds that many. It's an area. And you, you, when I was on stage, you could look and you couldn't see the end of the people. The mayor came back and said, there's 500,000 people. What and is it, that like? There's a DVD of it. There was a 21 camera shoot. That's why we did it. Um, it was the last show on the European tour in 2007 before we came to the States. And all the families came and it's on the DVD. It's, it's an amazing venue. So it's not a venue like, as, as a stadium or an arena, but it's an area. They call it Circa Messino, but it's Massimo, but that's Circus Maximus. It's this area. And there was just people all on the sides and on the ground. And during the day, it was about 92 degrees. We didn't play till nine o'clock at night. People were there all day. Wow. How they do that. Bands were coming in during the day at 12 noon. We didn't play till nine o'clock. Wow. So how do you get back to the space when you have to go to the restroom or something. So, uh, yeah. Pretty amazing. And I, and, oh, and by the way, and I recognize some of the people that were out in front again, 
The oh, from the, the same guy, the same uh, people that follow you guys around. And and when I see the DVD, they show those people sometimes. The, the camera guy just kind of goes over there. And I go, there they are. There's Ulrich. His name is, he's a German guy. I see him all the time. He's got a fan page. You, he has a fan. you know what? Um, I talk to different guys and bands and there's a, every sort of successful band has those guys. Like I was talking to someone the other day and uh, he's in a, a side project of with um, Paige McConnell from fish. Okay. And this guy shows up and Paige tells him, he goes, Oh, that's the timer. Cause this guy has a stopwatch and he times the solos. And if they're not long enough, he gives him a thumbs. It's a weird, but he's at like every show he's the timer and he's, you know, he's got his own thing going there. So I, I mean, you know, cult type bands, mm -hmm. bands with cult followings have those guys, you know, which, Hey, that's a better problem to have than no one's, you know, <laughs> None. <laughs> uh, toughest decision. Three more questions there. Toughest decision you had to, you ever had to make, or most difficult thing you had to do. Um, well, I, I think to go on that South American tour when my wife was going through chemotherapy was a tough decision. Uh, I might have had some other tough decisions before that, but that was the last one I can remember being yeah. very. Yeah, that's one of the most toughest things in my life. That's a really difficult thing to go through, man. I don't, I don't know. But, I, I, you know, her brother kind of saved the whole situation. So it made, I, it made it available to me. That's great. That's great. But what was the other question? No, that was, I only asked you that one. Um, it was toughest thing you had to do or most difficult. The oh, toughest I, decision you had to make or most difficult thing you had to do, which right. you answered. Uh, most embarrassing or funniest thing that's happened to you in the stage or in the studio, on stage or in the studio? Uh, I, I do remember one. Uh, it's <laughs> very funny. It's more funny. <laughs> Uh, we were doing the song in 1992 on the Genesis tour. We were doing the song "I Can't Dance," uh -huh. and what at one part of the song near the end we do this vamp, and so the song is going on a long time. And we and me and Mike Rutherford follow Phil, where he's going down steps, he's going by the PA, he was running back and forth, and if he runs, we run with him, and so he decides he's going to run up the stairs. So Phil starts running up the stairs, and he's just got we got guitars. And all of a sudden, Mike falls in front of me, going up this, and I fall on top of Mike. Oh my God! And I look at Mike, and, <laughs> and, he's, and he looks at me. He goes, "Okay, time to get off me." <laughs> and I noticed his lip is bleeding because what happened is the guitar hit him in the mouth. Oh wow! So that's it's it's an embarrassing moment, but we made light of it and yeah. we made it was fun. Yeah. But it was it was. Oh, by the way, and the reason why. We slipped. It had. It was raining out, so oh, wow. it's a bit slippery, and they're like metal stairs. And wow. uh, I think that was in Philadelphia in 1992. I know it was that tour we were doing. I can't dance, but I, feel that I won't run as fast from this point on. You know, he was. Yeah, just, good thing. Your memory is really sharp, man. Like yeah. your recall on dates and stuff. It's not like you, this is like three shows you're talking about over a career. This is like hundreds and, you know, thousands of shows maybe. It, it surprises me. I mean, my wife always says that to me. She says, how do you know? I said, because I base everything on the tour that I was doing that year. I can remember the tours. So it makes me remember, remember a certain incident that happened. Yeah, but you're like, it didn't take you three no. seconds to, to get that. That's pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, and last question. And I got to tell you. Thank you. You've been a, a really great guy to talk to. I'm really glad we got to connect. You're a real special guy. You're a very kind person. And I'm really happy you've had all the success you had. And oh, thanks for sharing everything. Uh, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much is a function of aging? I think, I think in the last 10 years, especially, um, remember I talked about patience before because I'm more patient. I think I'm better with um, people as far as uh, I used to be a little bit more anxious meeting new people or things but ever since I've been doing a lot on my own with my own band after the shows I get to meet you do a meet and greet yeah we talk I'm much easier with people I think my, my I'm a little more open than I used to be uh, with people 
even strangers. <laughs> You're a stranger in a way. I am. I am a stranger. No, you've been wonderful. It's been a pl- I feel like I've known you 10 years, man. I mean, yeah, it, you're it's, I the same way. I yeah, mean, you're an easy guy to talk to. So I, I, th- I think that's been the biggest change for me is just being aware of that. I'm aware of that. Hmm. Uh, and I'm a little more open about, okay, I'll do that. You know, I'll, I'll do that thing that you want me to do because uh, I'm not as nervous about it. I'm not as anxious about doing it. And that kind of, I was always a very anxious person. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. That's a minimizes the stress in your life. Yeah, it does. That's awesome. Listen, thank you for everything. I want to just tell people a couple of things you got going on. Uh, first of all, uh, guitar players, check out the DS1, the Godin, uh, Daryl Sturmer's signature guitar, and Daryl's last name is spelled S-T-U-E-R-M-E-R. And uh, you can go to Godin's website and check them out or call them up there. The folks are really nice. Um, Daryl has nine, is it not? I keep having a look. I'm sorry. Yes, nine solo albums. His last one is called Go. I mean, check any of them out, but you, uh, if you're a guitar player, I would encourage you to listen to the last one. It's a great record. And you can find them all on DarylSturmer.com. And also, uh, Daryl's got a Facebook page where you can connect with him on there. And um, hopefully, you'll be coming out with something new. Please come back on the show. I'd love to support it and turn my uh, listeners on to it. And come see Daryl with uh, Phil Collins. Or are you going to be touring in your own band? Uh, yeah, probably after. Well, after this tour, I'm going to be. I'm getting some dates together. Great, great, oh, okay. great. Well, is, will that be posted on your Facebook page? Yes. I, and, it'll be posted on Facebook. It'll be posted on my website. You have a good website, by the way. It's pretty clean. It's oh, it's okay. nice, man. Yeah, it's easy to navigate. So, and uh, your to be announced Instagram, pending Instagram <laughs> to the Daryl Starmer pending I, Instagram. Right. I, 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 you gotta like you gotta find like some thirteen year old kid. Spend half an hour with him or her. Okay. <laughs> You'll be all squared away, man. Not exactly. That's why I have kids. <laughs> That's it, man. Listen, uh, hang on one second. We'll wrap up. But thank you very much for everything. I wish you nothing but the best. Anything I could do to help you out, please let me know. Thanks, right? sir. Thanks so much for your time. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Check out DarylSturmer.com. Again, it's S-T-U-E-R-M-E-R. And support Daryl. Listen to his music. He's an incredible, incredible player. Again, all you guys listening to play guitar, check out his album, Go. It's freaking amazing. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play a guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. Daryl, thank you for everything.